Okay, I would load it in there, take care of all that stuff. What? I didn't touch anything.
Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, welcome to Columbia Journalism School, um, and welcome to an, a festival of uh, insight, as we like to call it. Um, actually, I've just made that up. But uh, I've, a festival of insight into um, the state of the uh, publishing and news industry uh, right now. Um, we've got a two-part of this afternoon. Um, sorry, I should have said, I'm Emily Bell, I'm the director of the Tao Centre uh, here at Columbia. Um, we're really delighted to host uh, people who are research partners, um, our friends and colleagues on the other side of the uh, Atlantic, which is the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism, um, and I'm particularly delighted to have Rasmus uh, Nielsen here with us, who is their research director, not least because he was uh, a, a, you can't call graduates from PhD programs graduates. He was a successful doctor uh, who came out of, our, out of our PhD program here at Columbia and is now at, uh, now at Reuters. Um, the format for the afternoon, I'm just going to talk you through the format for the afternoon. Uh, first of all, um, Rasmus is going to talk you through the findings of one of now the sort of real, um, if you like, keystones in data for digital journalism of the year, which is the publication of the, digital, the Reuters digital news report, um, which really sort of looks at a much wider global landscape than any other uh, report into this area, um, and always has fascinating findings uh, within it. Rasmus is going to report, uh, is, is, is going to walk you through the report for half an hour or so, and then we will have a panel discussion. We're delighted to have two of our for three of our four panelists, and we're hoping that um, the one train will divulge the fourth uh, by the time Rasmus has, has, has done with his presentation. Um, then, at, uh, after the panel discussion, we're going to um, have a Q&A. Uh, then there will be a coffee break. I know this sounds like a marathon, but honestly, believe me, it will go just like that. Uh, there's a coffee break at 3.15. Uh, then at 3.45, we have some new research coming out of the Tao Centre, which are, I just want to frame this as very preliminary findings, but it's uh, some original work that we've done looking at both platforms and publishers, and we've done both qualitative and quantitative analysis, uh, which we wanted to share with you today. Um, and then, uh, after that, if you are all still up for it, there may well be a drink downstairs. Um, so that's the shape of the afternoon. Without more, more ado, I'm going to hand over to Rasmus, uh, who will 
talk you through the findings of the 2016 Digital News Report. Rasmus, welcome. You are allowed to clap him. Thank you very much, uh, Emily, um, for the welcome. It's a particular pleasure to be back as an alumni um, of the J School and, and the doctoral program here. And a welcome opportunity to share some of our research with uh, one of our most important partners in the US, the Town Center, um, and of course, all of you. So we're very much looking forward to discussing um, some of the select findings from the 2016 Digital News Report um, with all of you. Um, this is where my slides ought to have been. Terrific. So just very briefly uh, about the Digital News Report. Um, the Digital News Report is an annual survey that we have been doing since 2012 at the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism at the University of Oxford, looking at how people uh, uh, get and, and use news across different platforms across a range of different countries across the world. Um, the 2016 uh, report, the um, fifth edition of it, covers 26 countries uh, across the world, uh, including uh, a range of countries in Europe with a combined uh, population of about 90% of the European Union's population, the US, uh, but also, very importantly, a selection of markets from elsewhere, including uh, samples of online news users in Brazil, in Turkey, and in Asia-Pacific markets like uh, South Korea and Japan. Um, in combined, uh, the 26 countries we cover this year have a combined population of 1.3 billion uh, people and account for a very large part of the online population currently living in more or less democratic uh, countries. Um, I should say before I launch into the findings that the survey is an online poll, so the data will tend to underrepresent the behavior uh, of people who are offline, uh, which primarily are less affluent and older people, and is a small minority in some countries, like the sort of wealthy North European countries, a uh, larger minority in some of the other countries that we, uh, that we cover in the report. So this is just sort of worth caveating some of the findings. These are about online news users in this report. The report is made possible by a range of different sponsors that include uh, news organizations like the BBC, uh, media regulators like Ofcom in the UK, uh, academic partners, different universities, nonprofit foundations, and other industry partners like Google, for example, which has been one of the major sponsors enabling us to expand this, uh, this project. Um, one of the things we do in the report is we have tracking questions to give us a sense of how things have evolved over time, particularly since 2012 when we started, obviously. And the headline figures here are not going to be surprising to anyone in this room. Um, we see very clearly uh, over time um, the rise of the smartphone as a device for accessing digital news and the relative decline in uh, the importance of desktop. Um, we see the uh, decline of print as a source of news, the rise of, uh, in particular, social media, but more broadly, the importance of online, and even the slow erosion of television, though it, is, it has been slow, uh, a slow erosion here of television, particularly amongst uh, younger groups. What I want today is to move away from these relatively well-known and well-understood sort of macro trends and try to look at what are some of the underlying changes that are a little bit less visible from the outside and where our report provides what we think is one of the sort of the few um, international, cross-national overviews of what does the ecology look like? What are the underlying changes beyond, sort of beneath the rise of social and the rise of mobile? And what does this mean for journalism in different contexts? Um, so the key findings that I will uh, highlight today include um, the increased use of social media for discovery and, of course, for consumption through off-site initiatives like Facebook Instant Articles and, and others, you know, Snapchat Discover. Um, the continued rise of smartphones as a sort of increasingly the defining device of digital news. Um, here, something interesting that will, might surprise some people in the industry, a much slower growth in the use of online video for news than many people in the industry had uh, anticipated and probably hoped for. Um, significant uh, and relatively new business issues that have to do with the rise of ad blocking and uh, limited growth in the percentage of people who say that they pay for news. Um, and a set of issues that are around how people, uh, if you will, perceive and experience this distributed content environment that it moves towards in terms of how they see the relative value uh, of different ways of getting news through personalized recommendations, for example, uh, or through editorial curation or other uh, ways. 
And finally, uh, I want to talk to the question of sort of the value and potential power of brands uh, in this more distributed environment in which many companies, both uh, legacy but also pure players, are wondering about what this looks like looking forward, whether people will recognize the value that's being created by pub publishers uh, when they get the news on other platforms, for example. So distributed content first. Um, it's very clear across all 26 countries that there's been a significant increase in the number of people who get news via social media. Um, the figure varies somewhat by country. There are countries in Northern Europe where this is a little bit lower, Asia Pacific too, but broadly speaking, a country like the U.S. is pretty much on the average across the 26 countries we have of 51%, a little bit lower than that in the U.S., but very close to half of all the online news users we survey say that they get uh, in the U.S. say they get news uh, from social media. And in some markets, and these are often markets that are characterized by historically much weaker publishers, combined with a very low level of trust in publishers from much of the population, it is a much larger number of people who say that they get news from social media. And just in terms of the, the pace of this development, broadly speaking, in most markets, the percentage of people who say they get news from social media has doubled. Uh, since 2013, so this is a very rapid growth. Um, not only do people say they get news from social media, but also increasingly a number of people say that social media is their main source of news, up to 12% now, and you can see the age uh, just differences here are very striking. This is just broken down by uh, age, uh, age group. Uh, for the first time in 2016, more people in the 18 to 25, 24-year-old uh, group say that they uh, see social media as their main source of news than say they see television as their main source of news. This is the first time we have this finding that social media is overtaking television as a main source of news for any of the demographics that we look at. And we can see in particular around certain events like for example the, the shootings in Paris uh, that social media really become a place to go not only for sort of an, a, a sense of what's going on in the world, but for really compelling and emotionally uh, touching and informative pieces of journalism. Only they are discovered and consumed within this environment provided by uh, different, different platforms that people increasingly go to also for news. Um, uh, for some, in some cases, there might be a, an element of substitution here, though we want to do more research on this to really understand the relationship in different audience groups. But this is one example from a focus group we did in the U.S., where there clearly is a participant in this group who, who see this as, a, to some extent, sort of a substitution for going direct to the site of a publisher. Um, why do people turn to social networks for news? This is really striking uh, for us when we ask people as to the motivations that some of these things are not really about the sociality, if you will, of social media, but more about the user experience. This is the idea that uh, people say, a large number of people say they go to social media for news because it alerts me to stories I might miss. I mean, I think this would be an editorial aspiration of most news organizations to provide the same experience, but this is a reason for going to social media that it provides a simple way to access a variety of sources. Again, I think a number of news organizations would aspire to offer a variety of least of views and different sort of perspectives and stories. And only uh, a relatively small number of people, 35% of the people who say they get news from social media, say that they go to social networks for news because of the ease of commenting and sharing. So the social nature actually seems to be less important here than the user experience of actually having a very um, quick and convenient one-stop shop for news, at least for many of uh, our respondents. Um, it's important to, to say, of course, here um, that um, some of this seems to be driven, if you will, by product development at the social end of things, because the uh, one trend we do not see, of sort of a dog that didn't bark in this year's report, is uh, the number of people who say that they share news on social media. That number has largely remained stable. So just to remind you, I mean, what we have here is a stability in the number of people who say they share news on social media, even as the number of people who say they get news on social media has, broadly speaking, doubled since 2013. So it seems to be more driven uh, by a combination of uh, product decisions by platforms and the fact that people <coughs> seem to be seeking out this content as part of the experience that they seek out uh, in social media. Um, more than anything else, uh, when we talk about social media here, uh, it is uh, primarily about Facebook, which is by far not only the most widely used social media platform amongst our respondents, but also by far the one that's the most used for news. So YouTube, for example, is widely used, but much less in most markets, much less used for news uh, than Facebook. And then there are a number of other platforms that are significant for particular demographics, Twitter in certain countries like the US, um, but particularly for sort of very uh, news-interested minorities. 
uh, messaging apps like WhatsApp. And then there are markets like some of the Asia Pacific countries that we cover where there are indigenous either messaging apps or social networks like Kakao in uh, South Korea and Line in Japan that are significant players in this space. So it's not that it's the same in every context. There are important contextual differences in the role that social media play and which social media play th that role. But broadly speaking, we see this very broad um, rise. Um, one um, version or sort of um, aspect of this that's generated a lot of interest uh, is the question of sort of messaging apps, in particular Snapchat, which offers Discover as an, uh, as an off-site distribution mechanism for content for select publishers. Some publishers have been very happy with the numbers. BuzzFeed and Cosmopolitan say that they uh, get a lot of traffic and, and views uh, via Snapchat. But with the exception of the 18 to 24-year-old demographic in the US and the rest of the countries and the rest of the age groups that we cover in the report, we see very little. Uh, evidence that, that large numbers of people have turned at least yet to Snapchat for um, news. And this, if you will, is just one indication of, of course, this can change over time, as we have seen with the growth of, of other social media platforms over time. But it is worth remembering that not everything that we obsess over in sort of industry discourse and analysis is always borne out by sort of broad uptake amongst actual news users. One other example of that can be uh, mobile news aggregators. Uh, where the number of people who say they get news from, for example, from Apple News or from Flipboard uh, in these three select markets is rather limited. Um, so it's important to underline that not every play from major tech platforms sort of magically, immediately transforms the industry. Uh, sometimes uh, the use case isn't there or people uh, don't necessarily see uh, the way in which this creates value or, or makes their lives better. Um, one way in which publishers have responded to this, of course, is through partnerships of various sorts, trying to leverage the power of platforms and, and work with platforms to distribute their content, generate more referrals, broaden the funnel in terms of securing more conversions to subscription and the like. But of course, there are other uh, attempts, too, to try to ensure that publishers still have direct routes to market, that publishers retain some sort of direct connection with the audiences that they aim to serve and the uh, audiences on which they build their business. Uh, one version of this is the um, if you increased uh, emphasis on various forms of what I think the New York Times, for example, called push. Um, so um, we have uh, things like mobile notifications uh, that increasingly publishers are thinking about ways in which to reach out more directly to users through the lock screen of their smartphone. We have email newsletters and the, and the like. So far, our survey suggests that there's been some growth in this over time, but perhaps not quite to the broad audiences than publishers might think. Again. Whether you see these numbers as sort of half full or half empty depend an awful lot on what your definition of success is. For some publishers, these numbers are very good if you're searching for a niche audience. But if, uh, for those who still aspire to a mass audience, these are, if you will, slightly less perhaps encouraging uh, numbers. Part of the transformation um, that, that the rise of social is part of, and of course things like mobile notifications and newsletters, of course, is centrally about what we might call the sort of the rise and rise of mobile. Uh, it's increasingly clear that the smartphone is the defining device of digital news. Uh, many publishers have the same experience in terms of their own data, in terms of where the traffic comes from, what, uh, where people spend their time, and how people access news. We can only uh, confirm this. We have continued high growth in the number of people who say they uh, uh, use their smartphones for news and the centrality of this device. Uh, a number of countries in Asia Pacific and Northern Europe are by now clearly mobile first markets in which the smartphone is a more important platform uh, for digital news than the desktop uh, internet is. Countries like Sweden, Korea, Norway, and so on and so forth. These are sort of rich uh, technologically developed markets, even more so than the US. And everything we see in our report and research so far suggests that this development will continue. Uh, there is no reason to expect that this is tapering off in the near future, in particular as the price of handsets come down and often also uh, data allowances uh, grow more generous. Um, it's clear that the, the growth of social and the growth of mobile intersect very powerfully. So when we ask people about how they come across news and break it down by the device that they say they use for accessing digital news primarily, uh, we see across uh, smartphones, tablets, and computers that uh, when you look specifically at people who, uh, who see smartphones at their main point of access for digital news, uh, they are significantly less likely to say that they access news via branded entries like a website or an app, and significantly more likely to say that they access it through uh, social, uh, social media. Um, just the one sort of specific use case of this is the question of, for example, we ask people the question of where do you get, uh, what's your first contact with news in the morning? 
Uh, there are interesting differences here. I mean, it's not that every country around the world is the same. So, for example, uh, in the UK, uh, a, a large number of people see radio as their first contact with news. This is largely about the strength of the BBC, but smartphones are increasingly uh, used. In the US, radio is less important, smartphones as important as in the UK. But then when you ask specifically about the ones who do get uh, news first thing in the morning from via a smartphone, how do you get it? The differences are quite interesting here between a country like the UK, where there are a few very strong anger brands like the BBC, where a very large share, almost half of the respondents who say they get news first thing in the morning via a smartphone, say they do it via a news website or app, large to the BBC app, uh, versus the US, where it's a much larger share that say that social media like Facebook uh, or Twitter is their main, uh, is their first, sorry, first contact with news in the morning via their smartphone. Another development that's been um, much sort of commented on and speculated about in the industry is the, um, the question of online video news, which clearly has been a sort of a major point of emphasis for both publishers and platforms in, in recent years um, with initiatives from a range of different players. Um, this is one of the things I foreshadowed in uh, the key findings I wanted to highlight today is that our data suggests that the growth in the number of people who say that they get online video news, and I should stress this is about news, is much lower than some uh, sort of commentary industry might give one reason to expect. So in the US, for example, which is the country in our report that has the highest percentage of people saying that they have gotten online video news, uh, the growth from 2015 to 2016 is from 30% to 33% saying that this is uh, something they've used. But broadly speaking, what we see is quite limited growth, a couple of percentage points up from 2015 to 2016, which given the amount of resources invested in this by platforms and publishers in terms of making digital dig, uh, video more integral to the digital uh, media experience, uh, for me at least was a surprising finding. Um, why? Well, when we ask people who say they do not get um, online video news why, we may find sort of at least elements of an explanation. 78% of our respondents say that they mostly read news on the internet and only occasionally use news video. We then ask follow-up questions about why. Um, one uh, reason uh, that's most frequently offered is that reading is quicker and more convenient than video, and I think many of us can probably recognize that. If what you want is an overview, headlines and scrolling through headlines is far more efficient and convenient from the user's point of view than video is. Um, second one is about the experience of advertising. Intrusive pre-roll advertising tend to put people off. And third, um, and this is I think an interesting point for newsrooms to consider, that videos often do not add to the tech story. And I think one can probably have the suspicion that sometimes the addition of video is driven more by a desire to monetize uh, through the highest CPMs of online videos, pre-roll advertising, than actually driven by a, an editorial ambition to add value to the story from the point of view of the user. And the question is, uh, will that work if people do not see this as adding uh, value? Um, one trend we do see with video that is in line with what industry sort of discourse would lead one to expect is the increased role of off-site consumption uh, of uh, online video. Um, we ask people a question that is sort of slightly hard to answer, but at least gives an indication of how people experience this about um, whether those who say they get online video news, whether they mostly watch it on news sites, or mostly watch it on social networks, or about the same. So here we just report only the ones who say they mostly watch it on news sites, the yellow bars, or mostly watch it via social networks, the blue bar. Um, there are countries like here where it's clear that publishers have effectively offered sort of relatively interesting uh, online video news experiences and still have a sort of a strong position here. There are countries like Italy where this is much less developed, the yellow bar is lower. But otherwise, the main difference here is the more important social media are for news, the more important, uh, the more likely it is people say they mostly encounter online video news off-site through platforms. So very clearly, a lot of the experience here is driven by the ways in which social media, uh, including uh, Facebook, but also uh, to a lesser extent YouTube and Twitter, are developing products that allow uh, for an interesting and sort of enticing experience for people to, to, to get online video news via these platforms that they use for a wide variety of other purposes. Um, as said, I mean, part of the rise of video clearly is about um, supply, if you will, driven by um, platforms probably eyeing the television advertising market and of course publishers wanting to find new ways of making money as their legacy business continue to erode. So if we turn next to the question of how the business um, of journalism uh, is developing, um, 
the first thing to say is that um, the central way of uh, supporting content creation uh, online for more than 20 years now, that is sort of free at the point of consumption, advertising supported uh, news production, is very clearly in serious trouble, um, more so probably than it was in the past where we thought we had serious uh, challenges. The first point to make is, of course, we see the widespread use of ad blocking. Um, in the US, 24% of our respondents say they have ad blockers installed. I should note that this is on their desktop browsers. The numbers in smartphones are still lower. But when you ask people whether they intend to do it in the future, they basically say, yes, we will. And also, I should add that when we ask people about whether they consider removing their ad blocker, basically no one is going back, intends to go back from this. And I should add also, of course, that across all the markets, far more younger people say they use ad blockers than older users. So clearly, uh, there is a central issue here with the rise of, of ad blocking. Um, when we ask people as to why they install ad blockers, uh, again, I think these are, are sobering uh, to consider, and they don't apply equally to every publisher, but at least they, they are indicative of how people actually experience using uh, digital news websites and apps. Uh, people say that they are fed up with the volume and distracting nature of advertisements in general. So everyone is punished for the sins of the sites that uh, load very slowly and where people feel are they're cluttered with advertising. Uh, people say they dislike ads that follow them around from one site to another. They have various forms of privacy concerns. Uh, and they say they want to improve the speed at which pages load. So interestingly, these concerns, it seems, again, are very much about the user experience uh, and perhaps less so about concerns over uh, data, for example, um, or uh, over issues like battery life. Um, if we turn from advertising, which clearly faces a new set of challenges around the move to mobile and the rise of ad blocking, uh, to the question of paying for news. Um, here we see only very slow growth in the number of people who report that they pay for news. And it is important to underline here that the growth is particularly slow in the extraordinarily competitive English language markets. So the, the countries that are highlighted in yellow here are the English language markets where the spillover from other brands obviously is much more pronounced than it is in more protected environments like some of the small northern European countries where you have very strong incumbents and very limited spillover because basically um, even the Huffington Post has not yet seen a clear business case for sort of starting producing content in Finnish uh, or Danish or Norwegian, uh, though I'm sure there are many Finns or Danes and Norwegians would be very pleased to see it. It has yet to arrive. So in some ways there are sort of some barriers to entry, it seems, for some of these smaller markets that help incumbents build a larger subscribe uh, 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 pay base. Um, of course, from a business point of view, it's not only about how many say they pay, but also how much they pay and for what. And here there are perhaps some more encouraging figures, which is that we do see a tendency in some of the more evolved markets, including the US, that more and more people say they subscribe to something. So incremental advantage on, on that front. And whether you think this is, um, these are terrible numbers, so 9% saying in the US that they pay for news online, or actually fantastic numbers, I think depend, depend a lot on what you expected when news companies started rolling out various forms of pay models um, uh, around 2010, 2011. Nine percent is a whole lot more than nothing. And from a revenue point of view, can be a whole lot more um, at attractive than what might be generated through advertising uh, alone, uh, in particular as CPMs continue to plummet for many, uh, for many sites. But part of the issue, as opposed here, is also about asking, bringing this back to editorial and the role of journalism, not only in sort of the institutional preconditions of the business and, and distribution of journalism, but also about what journalism means for a society and whether people feel that journalism adds value for them. One way in which we address this in the report is that we ask the, uh, the question about trust. Uh, Marty Barron has put that very forcefully on the agenda here in the US, and I think rightly so, asking this question of what is it about this issue of people, uh, increasing numbers of people saying that they have very limited trust in news, news organizations, and in journalism as a profession. So we ask questions around this. We, we have done some work with Marty um, in the past, so we ask these questions to see how that plays out comparatively. What we find is that there are countries in the world, mostly sort of um, high income, relatively egalitarian, uh, northern European countries, but also Canada, uh, where there uh, is a majority of the population say that they have a high degree or very high degree of trust in news, in news media organizations and in journalists. But it is also very clear that there are many countries in which this is not the case. And here the U.S. finds itself in the company of other proud nations like France and Greece, 
uh, with a minority saying that they have a high degree of trust in news and even fewer people saying that they trust journalists as a profession, which I think is a thought-provoking thing in particular as we stand in a journalism school. Why is this so? Um, we can see how this uh, intersects with some of the issues around the rise of distributed content when we ask people about how comfortable they feel with different ways of getting news online, so realizing that no display decisions are neutral, that every flow of information is filtered somehow. We asked people questions about how comfortable they feel with different ways of getting news online, filtered either by uh, automatic display decisions based on their previous consumptions or personalized recommendations, second judgments made by editors or journalists, and third, uh, social recommendations based on what my friends have consumed. In every single country, more people say that they find um, a personalized recommendation based on their previous consumption a, a good way of getting news online than say that they find editorial decisions made by journalists um, a good way of getting news online. But again, um, it's also the case in every country where we ask these questions that more people say that editorial decisions are a better way of getting news online than social recommendation based on what my friends have consumed. So if you want to think about this from the point of view of the user, basically it seems to us that the story here is that most people think that they are the best judges uh, of what they should consume and that if that can be automated based on what they've consumed in the past, that's probably a good thing for them. Uh, but they still trust journalists and editors more than they trust their inexpert friends. Um, so there is uh, a, a question here, if you will, as opposed of, of how news organizations can leverage this, perhaps in part about marketing, what the value is of editorial judgment, but also how they can leverage the power of recommendations, perhaps in particular personal uh, recommendations. The flip side of this, of course, is that um, even as people embrace personalized recommendations, at least to some extent, most people also express a lot of concerns about the implications of these ways of getting news. So. Um, we have uh, uh, more than half of our respondents saying that they are concerned that automated display decisions will lead them to missing out on important information. It's worth thinking perhaps about whether news media organizations can market what they do as a way of addressing that concern. Similarly, missing out on challenging viewpoints. More than half of our respondents say this is a major concern in terms of automated display decisions. And again, people have concerns about privacy, data protection, and how these things actually work. Uh, so we use these things enthusiastically uh, even as we harbor concerns about how they actually work. The question for many news organizations is in this environment, this increasingly distributed environment in which trust in news in general seems to be quite limited, in particular in a country like this and other countries with high levels of political polarization. Um, but the question then, I suppose, is what, what is the power of brands then in this environment if news is more and more distributed, uh, in, uh, more and more discovered through third party platforms, and when, if people, or many people at least, have a limited lev uh, level of trust in news? Um, so it's important to underline here that as much as this is going on, these developments, the rise of distributed, the, the levels of trust that I've uh, mentioned, it is still clear that brands are absolutely central to the way in which people navigate the digital environment and to, of course, the production of news that underlie uh, the distribution. Um, so across the 26 countries that we cover in the report, when we look specifically at different types of news providers, it is still the case that newspapers across their offline and online operations are the type of sor the source of news that most people say that they uh, rely on, followed by broadcasters and then third, digital-born brands that create their own content, like the Huffington Post, the BuzzFeed, and others, which I should say are particularly strong in the US, uh, where, where that, um, those startups have, in some cases, benefited from venture capital funding, which largely does not exist in any other market uh, for, for news ventures. We can look specifically at uh, the way in which this is uh, playing out if we compare some uh, startups, or sort of pure players, and some legacy brands in terms of their reach across a selection of markets. So for example, the Huffington Post has uh, successfully built a, a global scaled audience uh, with a very high level of reach across a number of markets, particularly English language markets and, and the home market in the US, but also many others. And by now, 11% of our respondents across the 24 countries in which we asked about the Huffington Post say that they have used the Huffington Post as a source of online news in the last week. Others are growing, like BuzzFeed, Though it's also worth noting here that Vice, for example, is very, very rarely mentioned as a source of news by our respondents, only 2% across 24 uh, countries. Um, and if we compare this performance with uh, legacy brands, 
um, it's striking to see how relatively quickly, and not overnight, but how relatively quickly a brand like the Huffington Post has become a more widely used source of online news than historically very strong and internationally oriented brands like the BBC and CNN, which are used by fewer people uh, across uh, the markets that we cover in the report. Um, the way in which this plays out in different countries is strikingly different. So in a country like the US with a long history of a quite regionalized, decentralized news environment of very few genuinely national brands, we have very few brands that have higher reach. Uh, so sort of the highest reach are sort of Fox News, Huffington Post, and Yahoo News in terms of brands that people say they get news from. But there are other countries like the UK or Finland uh, and Poland too in Central Europe where there are a limited number of brands that have a very, very high reach and a very high proportion of those who say they use them also saying that this is my main source of news. We, we think of these as sort of anchor brands that help structure an information environment. And one thing that is quite striking is that in some countries these are largely absent, either in very large um, uh, markets uh, like the US or in some cases in uh, markets like France, which obviously is much smaller, but uh, and historically has had a much weaker legacy media industry uh, than, for example, the UK or, or uh, Finland. So do brands still matter then? I mean, we would definitely say yes, brands va matter very much in terms of how people navigate this environment. Um, and we, we have focus groups where, where people, including young respondents, say the same things. Do these news brands still matter then? Uh, two respondents immediately volunteering, yeah, they do. And in the future, will they still matter? Uh, I would be disappointed that they didn't, because then how do we know if we're getting accurate information or not? There's still an element uh, here of belief, at least in accuracy and verification. Um, and another respondent saying, I, th I still think brand matters. I still think you go to the more reputable ones by far. I don't think that's going to change. Of course, um, when we turn to sort of the discussion points and the uh, recapping the main points here is the question is even if there is real value here still uh, going forward in brands and, a, and an element of appreciation of what those companies have historically represented and aim to deliver in the digital future too, there are a set of questions about whether a sustainable business can be built around this um, and a set. Uh, I think some of the main points that would be particularly interesting to discuss uh, with all of you, but also and particularly probably with uh, to hear our different panelists offer uh, their perspectives on from, from different points of view is, uh, is how this business uh, and profession will look like in the future as more and more of us are getting news through social networks and aggregators, often in ways that supplement and extend uh, news brands, but also perhaps sometimes in ways that may supplant uh, news brands, and particularly commercially. Uh, how mobile news consumption is becoming more important and what the profession of journalism and the business of journalism looks like in that uh, scenario. Uh, how uh, we can think about the role of video when it seems to be incredibly powerful for telling very compelling stories around certain events like the Paris attacks, but at least so far does not seem evident, uh, evidently to add value for many, many consumers, even people who are very digitally savvy and otherwise very happy with using social media video or Netflix for over the top content, but may not actually see the added value of online video news in many cases. Um, there is a question about the business that underlies a lot of this, that the business that historically has enabled the profession to try to hold power to account, how uh, the combination of distributed content, the rise of mobile and ad blocking presents a whole new challenge to the business of news that was already quite difficult for a long time, but maybe becoming even more difficult, at least for many brands, if not all. Um, there is the question of what is, if you will, the public perception of the value of journalism. All of us in this institution, all of us in this room can stand up and give the off-the-finish speech about why journalism import is important for democracy and, and many other things, but it is not at all evident that the public shares this high regard for journalism and there is a real question whether journalism in a way has, if you will, a PR problem. Finally. Many brands are still valued, but most people still aren't prepared to pay online or even watch the advertisements that uh, have sustained much news production. Uh, so uh, the question here is, if there is value here, how can that be realized in a way that will continue to underpin the important work done by the profession uh, in countries around the world? So uh, with that, thank you very much for your uh, attention. Um, we should turn now to a panel discussion where I'll invite uh, our distinguished panelists, including, of course, Emily uh, Bell as director of the Tao Center, uh, Vivian Schiller, who's an independent strategist, has previously worked at Twitter, NPR, New York Times, and a couple of uh, other important players in this space, 
Uh, Liz Heron, the executive editor of the Huffington Post, and also um, someone with a professional past at a variety of other interesting uh, organizations in this space. And Edward Russell, from, uh, who is chief uh, innovation officer at Dow Jones, uh, uh, which publishes, amongst other things, the Wall Street Journal. So if you will join me up here, please, we will start off with a, uh, with a panel discussion. <laughs> Emily, um, can I maybe start with you? I mean, you're going to uh, tell us more about your research so far about um, the relationship between publishers and platforms. Um, um, how many of the sort of the broad trends we document and use resonate with the discussions you are having here with the, with publishers and platforms? Um, I think that there's an enormous amount of um, I, well, it's not, not even overlap, correlation. So uh, all the broad trends you describe are absolutely the same trends that we see, particularly the correlation of mobile uh, and as it grows, the idea that sort of, if you like, news becomes a, a socially consumed um, commodity. So in other words, you know, that, that it is all being driven by the smartphone. So that's something that we, we see a lot of. Uh, I think what's interesting is if you if you actually um, are in New York uh, and you talk to platforms and you talk to publishers, etc., and then you look at the really broad sweep of what's happening out there in the world, and we know that one of the challenges researchers have is kind of keeping up with the pace of how everything changes. So, in the, you know, in the olden days, which were all of five years ago, you were relatively c sort of confident that the things that you would be putting up on a screen that you researched maybe three months ago would still be current. So some of the numbers I think that surprised us is, is, is possibly, you know, that when we see things like sort of relatively low adoption rates of, uh, you had one slide which was, um, it's because I have a terrible memory, uh, when, you, when you look at something and you think, um, I'm sure it's moved faster here, but that could be, and this is why your research is so important, that because we spend our time with our heads in this all the time, there is a tendency for us to think everybody is consuming all their news on through social apps on mobile phones. You know, Facebook is very dominant. Um, I think we've seen in the Pew research uh, and your research that there's definitely sort of, as it were, some differences about the speed of adoption and the roles of platforms. Um, the thing that we don't have in the States, which is completely fascinating, is where you have strong, well-funded, large, maybe sometimes, dare I say, I hate saying this in America, state-funded broadcasters. You have um, a very different relationship with the news ecosystem. So one of the things that's very striking is how the market uh, driven economy is completely different from the mixed economy. And I think that's fascinating as we get into the further discussion of what is the role of large technology companies in this world um, and how is that actually going to affect the commercial market. Um, Liz, can I maybe turn to you next? I mean, it seems sometimes this conversation about the relationship between publishers and platforms is cast in quite sort of confrontational terms, sometimes even sort of a zero-sum game terms. It's publishers versus platforms, it's publishers or platforms. Is that the way it feels like when you run the Huffington Post here? No, we don't really see it that way. I mean, at Huffington Post, you know, as an 11-year-old digital native publisher, and I think a lot of its success has come in tandem with the success of platforms. You know, so we see ourselves as part of an ecosystem rather than you know, alone fighting the good fight um, without any sort of, you know, in a vacuum without any sort of context. So, you know, a lot of the success of the Huffington Post was initially um, because of the rise of Google. You know, we pivoted into the social media ecosystem very well, I would say, and now we're very much thinking about what is the next evolution of our role in that ecosystem um, as a publisher and um, as a news provider and also just as a publisher that's honestly providing value to the platforms as well. Like they provide us with a lot of value. Uh, you know, you, there's never been a time when you can get a bigger audience uh, than you can right now, a bigger, more widely distributed uh, audience around the world. But we also provide them with a lot of value as well. And that's how we're approaching our relationship these days is thinking our, of ourselves as collaborators and partners for the most part um, versus 
you know, in a zero-sum game, fight for the audience and fight for to win the future. And, and that's been, um, I think, very positive for our newsroom and our overall organization. And um, it also allows us to have a little bit of leverage uh, to push them on the things that aren't necessarily working for us. And I think that's a trend that I see happening a little bit more in the news industry overall. Edward, um, I mean, you, you work at a company where, with most of your brands, the business approach is very different from, from uh, Huffington Post in terms of their ambition being primarily about scale and, and an advertising support one. You have a lot of more niche-oriented um, upmarket brands that are about um, pay. How does this play out in that environment or in that context? I think uh, in the context of the relationship with the platforms, I think the question for us is how do the platforms help us execute our strategy? And our strategy is fundamentally about subscription. Uh, so a brand like the Wall Street Journal alone has more than 2 million subscribers, of which uh, about 893,000 are digital only. So when we look at a platform, it's really about the quality of the relationship with that platform and being really clear about what that platform does in terms of helping us accelerate uh, our strategy. So an example would be uh, Snapchat, and I see a, a colleague of mine, Carl, over there, he's looking at her phone, uh, who runs our Snapchat platform. Um, you know, a, an example of that platform is that it, that brings to our brand an audience that we would otherwise struggle to reach. So that sort of 18 to 25 year old audience. Uh, getting that audience into our brand is incredibly important in terms of the future of our digital subscription uh, strategy. Another example would be our relationship with Apple News, and again, the quality of the dialogue with Apple in terms of being able to use Apple as a way where people can sample our content and then ultimately become subscribers. Um, and, and a third example would be our relationship with Facebook, where again, uh, it introduces a whole wide variety of people that we may not otherwise reach to our brand. But ultimately, the goal is to use those platforms to drive people uh, to ultimately become what we call members of our community. Vivian, um, I mean, Edward talked about the future, if you will, sort of looking forward in particular in terms of how these younger demographics who rely more on social media for, for getting news. I mean, you have worked in different roles at both ends of this relationship. If you see how things are playing out now, um, what do you make of the fear that some people express that parts of the news industry now are in danger of outsourcing their future and losing control of the distribution? Well, it's real. I mean, you talk about, you know, the notion of whether uh, that, that, that fear and that danger is absolutely real. And, you know, you talk about sort of is it us versus them. I mean, it's not even us versus them because it's not a fair fight. I mean, the scale and the power of the platforms, you know, to their credit, they built something extraordinarily useful, uh, extraordinarily useful to a large percentage of the world. So they win. And the fact is that is, particularly when you're looking at younger demographics, that is where the audience is. And publishers do understand that, that in order to reach and grow audiences, they are on Facebook, Snapchat, and others. But it is, um, you know, I, I think the, the, the platforms, and you know, I've worked on both sides, and I still have friends on both sides, would make it seem that it's a partnership. And on the one hand, the platforms very much need news brands because those news brands they, they, the, the platforms need news because news is what will get people to come back multiple times during the day. On Facebook, your neighbor's baby picture is not going to get you to come back multiple times in the day. So, um, but it's, um, it, other than that, they, 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 the, the platforms are holding all the cards. And for news organizations, you know you need to be there, but it's a black box. You do, you're putting your content there. There's sort of a vague promise of, revenue and of growth and of value back, but it remains to be seen. I mean, just look at um, instant articles. I think many people, instant articles seems like an incredible idea and it could be a win-win, but the reality on the ground right at this moment for instant articles is for many publishers, possibly most publishers, they're not seeing the return from instant articles so, and not seeing the revenue from instant articles. So it's, you know, it's a very precarious, dangerous moment. Liz, I mean, you, you brought up this issue too, the idea that, that publishers uh, offer something of real value to the platforms. Um, but just to pry a little bit at that, um, even, if publisher, even if platforms benefit from news as a whole, um, in what way do they need you specifically? I mean, there are so many different content creators out there, and does it make a difference for Google or Twitter or Facebook uh, whether any one brand is part of, uh, of their environment? That's a good question. I mean. You know, I think you prove your value 
uh, by your audience, you know, and, that, and that's one thing we haven't even really discussed so far in the discussion is it's not just the publishers, it's not just the platforms, it's also the people who uh, we're trying to reach. That's ultimately the, the major mission for, for us, at least on the publisher side, is to create news for that new generation and for anybody who whose habits are changing um, with all the technological and, and, and ecosystem changes that you were discussing in your report. So, um, you know, maybe, I don't know, you'd have to ask someone from the platforms whether they think about specific brands in terms of uh, do or die, but I would say they very much think about the ecosystem uh, and as a publisher, you know, proving your value uh, to your audience is what's gonna make the platforms uh, sit up and take notice. Um, that's yeah, how I think about it. If I could interject, there's one very interesting data point in your report, Rasmus, which showed that 51%, uh, more than half of people who are reading news on social media don't recognize the brand. And I think that does, you know, give us pause for reflection, because you know, in the end of the day, you know, the value of our brands is in trust and the recognition of that brand. And if more than half of people aren't recognising the brands, then it does raise some questions about the value of sort of these social networks to the brands. It also raises questions, though, about how we're differentiating ourselves as brands, uh, which is something that you know we think about a lot at the Huffington Post. Uh, you know, we cover all the news that's out there in sometimes straight ways and other ways that's very much clear and core to our identity and that's something that every publisher would be wise to think about. I think, I think, I mean, I've heard Liz say this before and she's absolutely right, which is once your brand is out there, uh, the digital environment is so noisy um, in one sense in terms of the range of stuff that you have, but also, you know, it's designed to serve the individual really rather than the brand, you know, the whole kind of way that we consume and look at social media does. So some of the, some of the things that, you know, if you, if you stick around and, and, and listen to our research, the, the concern about brands is, is, is really sort of incredibly high in publishers' minds. And this idea, I think there's an interesting idea here about differentiation because, of course, all news brands think, how do we differentiate ourselves? And yet, unless newsrooms have changed radically since I was last in one, um, what they actually do is look at each other all the time to see who is doing what, where. So sometimes, I, you know, it's, it's a kind of a question, really, which is this desire to differentiate. How often is it really executed well? Because it seems to me that... You know, it's harder now sometimes to tell the difference between some New York Times and some BuzzFeed content than it was three years ago. Before we leave that, because I just want to make one other point, which is we have to, in, in, it's part of this discussion, we have to just mention the word algorithm here, because that's another important element of this is, you know, as a, as a publisher, you can publish it with the exception of, of Twitter, which is not yet an algorithm, everybody else is moving to an algorithm. And, you know, you can publish to the platform but what are what what are the what how is the algorithm going to deliver you to the audience? Will it deliver you to the audience? What audience? So I mean that is and that's completely in control of the of the platforms and also makes it sort of a bit of, a bit of a difficult to have a strategy and make sure that your content is seen, let alone your brand recognized. Uh, I mean, I think that's a really important point, uh, Vivian, and it seems I think more and more publishers are really thinking about this issue of how if in the past you communicate your identity and your value through the totality of the experience, how you can replicate that or enhance that at the level of individual stories or even at the subatomic level beyond just the story but the snippet, how is it you can tell the story about not only the story, but also about the Wall Street Journal uh, in a single article that people may encounter in an environment where you don't actually know what it's next to or why they're even seeing it or what's the use case, what's the experience they were looking for when they happened upon your content in that environment. Um, Edward, I wanted to ask you um, something as sort of a follow-up prompted by Emily's point about how um, much of what goes on in the industry sometimes it seems uh, uh, like as for an observer and, and, and for Emily as, as someone who had a, a position in the industry itself in, in the not so distant past, a sort of a case of um, imitation, sometimes irrational imitation, being a response to an environment characterized by huge change and uncertainty. Uh, and I guess I wanted to hear a little bit from maybe from your point of view of, as uh, News Corp more broadly, but also uh, Dow Jones is sometimes I think seen as a as a, a company and a, a set of brands that, that have made other decisions about how to do their business, do their journalism, and uh, engage with platforms. Um, what is that like um, when a number of sort of public intellectuals basically say you're all idiots? Um, are you just sort of uh, sen about that, or what is that like to be on the inside? I mean, well, they may be right, but um, <laughs> the, the you know, I think I think the key it, it does it does hop back to what Emily was saying, what Liz was saying about being differentiated is, you know, I, I read this morning somebody did some research that showed that there's <clears throat> 21 million 
clickbait stories that are published a month, which is incredibly depressing statistics. That's almost a quarter of a billion clickbait stories published a year. Putting to one side what a clickbait story might be, we understand that what that is, which is a commoditized story. So I think being very, very differentiated is incredibly important in terms of journalism, but it's probably also important in terms of the business model. And um, you know, a publication like the Journal um, was, was heavily criticized for implementing um, what was then called a paywall um, 20 years ago and sticking to it rigidly throughout that whole year process. But the net effect of that is that we have a very vibrant digital subscription business. So for many, many years in that period, people told us we were wrong, said it was a mistake, uh, it should be dismantled, we should be chasing scale, we should be chasing eyeballs. And I think the people who ran the company over that period of time were incredibly level-headed and very strong-willed in resisting that temptation. So being a contrarian, I think, um, is almost certainly a good thing in this current market. And I point to another very interesting bit of data that came out of your report, uh, Rasmus, which showed that for all the um, hype around video, uh, most people, it seems, don't want video when it comes to scanning news. I think the data showed that 78% of people preferred text uh, or looked look to text to scan news, and only 5% went for video. So there's inc incredible pressure to follow what's fashionable in digital media. And I think that the people who win will be ultimately those who are very reflective, who try things out, but um, form their own views about what the successful business model will be. Is it worth maybe taking a range of responses to that, the video finding? Uh, that was quite surprising for me. I guess I had drunk the Kool-Aid a bit and, and thought that the amazing figures that are offered by various players reflected a huge growth in, in video. I mean, Emily, your take uh, on video? Well, you know, we did a report two years ago out at the Tower Centre where we said video in newsrooms, and particularly legacy newsrooms, so these are effectively what were newspapers adopting and developing uh, video teams? You know, we, we made the observation that none of it really works, which is a ter rather damning thing for a uh, journalism school to say. But the, but the basis of that, that was this, which is actually good video, good compelling video um, is still pretty hard to produce. It's not that hard to shoot video anymore, but it's quite, quite hard to make good video consistently. Um, and it costs quite a lot of money. So what actually happened, I think, was you have, and I, I lived through some of this, you have enormous pressure from your commercial departments saying, produce more video. But unless you've configured your um, uh, p and in a particular way, what tends to happen is that you have journalists who are doing more video and it's being produced, and there's no clear view of whether it's actually, actually worth it. If it takes three people a day to produce a, you know, 30-second clip, nearly always text is going to work better for you in a traffic environment. Video may work better for you in an attention environment, but we still haven't found a particularly great way of monetizing that. And the other thing is, sorry to say it, uh, we're trying to improve this at, the, uh, at Columbia, but a, you know, co my colleague, Dulin Tu, who teaches in the video concentration here says, how much bad news video is out there, really, at the moment? I mean, a lot of it is really terrible. Um, and so what you're seeing is a reflection, I think, of the pressure, and the pressure is now coming from the platforms as well. So, you know, I went to the F8 developer conference. Mark Zuckerberg said, it's video, video, video. It's all about video. Um, you have Facebook paying um, certain publishers to use live video. Uh, you know, kind of all of that sort of slightly, as you say, Rasmus, it muddies the waters and how we feel about we must be doing this. Um, but, it, you know, as I say, our research always showed that you know, there, there isn't really yet the sort of the market for it. So it was interesting that it was reflected in news figures, actually, because that's very much the sort of the, the sentiment that you feel, I think. It's good to see data on it. Well, I would be interested in the age of the respondents. I think, I think that probably matters, I would guess. Um, you know, at the Huffington Post, we still love text. Uh, the vast majority of our newsroom is, is focused on writing and edi editing. Um, but we also have a thriving video, multiple video units. It's something we've expanded quite a bit this year, and you know, we our numbers are quite good actually. And and I think you know, to to your point, Emily, it's very important to think about, you know, what is good video in this environment? What environment are you making video for? Uh, so we one big shift that we made this year when it came to video was thinking about platform-specific content. So, so where are people likely to find and watch and share this? Uh, 
you know, do we want them to find it at the moment that news is breaking, or is it something that we hope will be relevant to them for a long time? For the most part, we've chosen the latter, uh, with the exception of live streaming news. Um, you know, but we, you know, we acquired a VR, a virtual reality company earlier this year called Riot, which was very aligned with our brand and our identity, and we're making a big bet that virtual reality, which may not be, you know, the, the best mode of consumption right now for everybody, we, we think it will be an important uh, news vehicle in the future, and it and is having a moment right now. So, you know, I think to some extent you have to, as Edward was saying, take a step back and make decisions based not necessarily on what your competitors are doing, but what you think is going to be the way people will consume and pass along news in the future. And I have a pretty strong bet that video is going to be a massive part of that, even if it may not be uh, a widely adopted thing right now for everybody at all ages. But I think for young people in particular, what we hear, it's, um, it's the way they communicate. I will say, you just can't ignore the reality that, that uh, online video is the only source of revenue for, for digital news that isn't falling. I mean, it's, uh, you can't ignore that. Now, of course you can't. If the audience is not going to be there, then it won't work. But at the moment, for whatever reason, uh, video CPMs are still really, really strong. The only other source of revenue that, that you know, is still showing a lot of promise is you know, branded content. So I don't know how you ignore that. Plus the fact that you know, Facebook has said their entire stream, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has said is the entire stream is going to be video in X number of years. I want to just raise one other point, which wasn't in your presentation, but it is in your in the, in the, in the research, which is how, in, what can, what, if one of the most surprising things to me out of the report was the, the enduring power of television. We've all been predicting that television's gonna have their moment, here it comes, they, they're just blind to it, the disruption is coming, and yet, it, they, they, the, in the last year, um, uh, audiences are, are, um, are rising for television. I mean, it is extraordinary, and you, you point out an interesting statistic in this one, which is this is the first year that for, what is it, 12 to 24-year-olds, that actually just, they just barely, um, online news has just ticked up slightly above television news, but that's amazing that this has only just happened and it's still neck and neck for television, and that's just the youngest demographic. I'm going to return to the TV point. I think Edward wanted to get into the video yeah, point, sorry. and then Emily. Well, well simply to say that, um, you know, uh, for, for us, we are, we are seeing growth in, in uh, digital subscriptions. So in terms of, you know, and, and I realize, you know, your report showed that only 9% of people in the U.S., you know, will pay for news, will prepare to pay for news. Um, but, but for the, the, some of the companies that are, are in that category, it is a growth business. And, and I think where that does connect with video is that I think the key question with video is in, in what way is it additive to a story? And for many stories, it's not additive at all. And for certain stories, it's absolutely critical. But I think with that mindset that you know, vi with video, graphics, pictures need to be additive to a story is the kind of the way forward, particularly if you're trying to be distinctive and distinguished from other people in the, in the industry. I, I, just on the video point, and um, actually Vivian and, and Liz are both absolutely completely right, as I say, you kind of, you know, uh, I think sort of we've got, you, you can't resist it as a news, organi as a news organization now. Um, whether you can lo long term make money out of it, the CPMs are going to be really interesting because as people expand their offering, does the advertising hold or does it fall through the floor? But, you know, the, the, other, um, the other interesting data point from, from one of your slides, Rasmus, was really how strong CNN is as a brand, which is kind of interesting because uh, it has, um, somebody wrote a piece recently, possibly in Even Lab, about, you know, the quiet revolution within uh, CNN. What's interesting, I think, for new entrants now, Huffington Post, I would slightly set aside from this because you guys are in video very early for um, digital newsrooms and doing a lot of it. But when you look at what the BBC is doing, what, you know, kind of on the experimental end, something like PBS Frontline is doing, and what CNN is doing, you know, it, it kind of, I think that um, their brand recognition figures among young people are really strong. And you don't need to look at many kind of cable viewing figures to know that they're not switching on the set to watch them. So I think that, you know, in as much as uh, currently what's happening is that legacy news organizations, I think, are looking at video and thinking, maybe there's an opportunity for us to disrupt broadcasters. The interesting question for me is, are broadcasters going to sort of learn the lesson of print and actually, um, you know, to use a sort of almost cliched, ridiculous jargon term, disrupt themselves? You know, are they actually going to be the people who benefit more from that disruption rather than being defensive? So I think it's, an, I think it's a really fascinating open question.
A brief commercial break. Uh, for those who want to have a look at the data, the full report is available at a website called digitalnewsreport.org. The full report is there. The data is there, so much more than is actually in the report. If you have particular issues you're interested in, particular countries you're interested in, you can really dive in. There is a sort of interactive interface for looking at the data. If you want the full data set, send us an email, and we are happy to share uh, the slides. You will also find on that site a uh, report that I uh, wrote with Richard Sambrook, the former uh, head of news at the BBC uh, in April about raising this question, what's happening to television news? And I would uh, add to Vivian's point about sort of the surprising in, in sort of um, staying power of television where many have cried wolf for some time, um, that it is important to keep in mind that um, what's underlying the seeming stability in overall viewing is that older people are watching more television and younger people are watching much less television. So the averages look great, but um, viewing amongst 18 to 24 year olds old from memory in the US is down 24 percentage points uh, in two years. Uh, that's directly comparable to the rate of decline in print in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, in terms of the, sp the, the pace, this is not something that overnight leads to the collapse of an industry, but over a decade, that is a very real decline. Um, and um, we should also remember uh, that as much as print newspapers have been maligned, that the average age of many television news audiences is significantly higher than the average age of print newspaper readerships. So f again, from memory, I think the average age of Fox News viewers is 67 or something like that, um, and only slightly lower for the other cable networks. So stay tuned. Uh, television may be... Um, more uh, robust uh, than print has been, but perhaps less so than many television producers might think. I wanted to return, uh, and perhaps this might be particularly interesting to hear from Edward and Liz about how you think about this um, in your organizations, about the, the question about how you think about the production side and the business side of online video news if you are placing that bet and saying, we will see how we can create value here for our users, but also for our business. Um, it seems to be the case that um, Video is uh, extraordinarily good for certain stories, Paris, for example, and really poor at many, many routine stories. So how do you think about production if you have to be, have the capacity in place to do video well when the opportunity presents itself, when the great story is there where you can really add value for your users, but you may not actually want to use it all the time to do sort of everyday routine news coverage? And how do you think about the business? It seems uh, we are going to release a report on online video news later this month that does a deeper dive on this, including some industry data, that it seems that um, much more so than many other parts of digital news consumption, um, video is really a sort of a blockbuster-driven, hit-driven economy where a few videos generate enormous num numbers of views, and most videos generate very few uh, views. Uh, that is extraordinarily different from the way in which news, the news business has worked in the past, which was based on a routine audience with relatively little fluctuation in advertising and, and subscription revenues. Here it seems to be the case that we have this very, very hit-driven, sort of blockbuster-driven economy. Is that something you can recognize, uh, Liz, for example, from, from the Huffington Post? Well, let me start with the production side. Um, so at the Huffington Post, we actually think there are great video stories every single day. We have multiple video units. Um, one of it is called HuffPost Rise, and they have an editorial mandate that very much ladders up to our one of our main editorial pillars, which is wellness and solutions-oriented journalism. And that is just what they do all day, every day. Um, so sometimes they connect with the reporters and writers who are, who are writing. Other times they have their own story agenda, but they produce four to six uh, video stories a day on that topic, and they do very well. Um, in fact, as a journalist who's been covering something like climate change and the environment for a long time, the existence and the success of HuffPost Rise on that particular topic has been incredible to see. And I think it's young people, because we approach environmental coverage from a solutions perspective in video, it's very visual, it's very interesting and inspiring. We're taking a look at this huge inexorable problem uh, from the perspective of the people and places and organizations that are having some success in chipping away at it. Um, you know, that's been extraordinarily successful um, to get audiences to care a little bit more about climate change, for instance. Um, so we have HuffPost Rise. We also have a HuffPost original video team that does a lot of short form political video and, and links up with our voices coverage, like our feminist vertical, black voices, Latino voices. Um, 
Uh, and then we also have a live streaming team, and they're more of the news team that will go live when it's warranted. And, and you know, we're doing a lot of testing. It's, it's the people who used to run HuffPost Live really expanding into a mobile environment. Um, so we actually don't see it as something that we have to search for every day. And we actually, you know, you're saying that video is often at the at Dow Jones seen as additive to a story. To us, it sometimes just is the story. Um, and, and there are times when the newsroom and the video units are collaborating quite closely, and there are other times that they're running after their own stories. And we make a judgment call that this is a story better told in video, or this is a story that's so complex or just not visual enough that it's better told in text. Um, but you know, I will say that uh, one of our best performing uh, pieces of journalism from the Orlando shooting coverage was a video that we shot. We, we had been planning to go to an iftar in um, Union Square. To, we were doing a lot of Ramadan coverage as part of our Voices uh, vertical for video. And the iftar actually got shifted into um, a tribute to the victims of the Orlando shooting. And we did a very short, beautifully shot video. I think it was like 45 second long video just um, you know, capturing that scene, and that was the by far <laughs> the most viewed, shared, um, pass along piece of content that we did. Um, and that was a story that we didn't even do a write up for. It was just that that is the kind of story that you want to see and feel and experience. Um, that was very relevant to the story they were doing. So, so for us, it's not so much of an issue about how or what to cover. Um, and we're working through sort of the smartest ways and best practices to to collaborate when that's warranted. But um, those units tend to work operate often on their own. Yeah, I, I just I, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think it, there's no substitute for journalistic sensibility in the end of the day. So I mean, you know, clearly with certain stories, the video is the story, and in other cases, it's a, it's an element of the story. I think my, my 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 thoughts would be it can't be contrived. In other words, it can't be a business side diktat that you need to have produce X number of you know videos per day, because consumers will just reject it if 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 the, if the video isn't in itself compelling or compelling in that it's part of a broader package that's compelling, that people just won't read it or won't watch it. I, I think that's what, and the, the other point is, you know, what are we doing to create video uh, off platform? So if, if we have a core platform, that's great. And I think people's strategies are more or less laid out now. They are what they are. But, you know, what are we doing to play in the platforms where people are consuming large amounts of video? So Facebook would be an example, but Netflix would, could be, it would be another example. Amazon Prime is another example. And I think that's an exciting discussion as well, and people have different views on that. It's an, and for most publishers, that's an embryonic discussion, and, and which platform is a natural fit for your brand. Um, so we're, you know, we're looking at one or two projects at the moment, which are far more ambitious than projects we've done in the past, because we're liberating ourselves and we're thinking, you know, could we play on platform X, and if so, what would the proposition be? So I think you know, the, video, the video discussion has got some way to play out. My only point would be, uh, you can't fight your audience. You can't impose video on them if they don't want to. Let me just quickly go back to what you were saying about production and, um, you know, video as a medium that often will have one big hit and then a lot of things that don't necessarily resonate as strongly with the audience. Um, I mean, at the Huffington Post, we that's just our standard operating procedure. We know that uh, you have to produce a lot to find what works. Um, so we're used to producing a lot. Like I was saying, Rise does four to six stories a day. And maybe one of those will really, really take off. But with each one, we learn a little bit more about our process and what the audience is responding to. So for at least for now, volume is still a game that, that we are playing in order to find the best video that we can do. Edward uh, used the phrase, there is no substitute for journalistic judgment or editorial judgment. What, what comforting words uh, in a journalism school. Um, maybe this is where we should turn to the, the questions we had around uh, whether people found different ways of filtering information, a good way of getting news, uh, personalized recommendations versus editorial curation versus social recommendations. Uh, Vivian, um, you mentioned earlier on in the discussion um, that Twitter is, is one of the social media platforms that, that so far has uh, pretty much, not entirely, but pretty much stuck to the reverse chronology, um, but most others uh, offer a filtered experience in, in a variety of different ways and with different degrees of sort of user control over how things are filtered. Um, what do you make of this? I mean, people like myself who are quite fond of sort of nussle and or, you know, if you like X, you might also like Y. Are we completely insane? Uh, um, or, or is it fine that we get these automated um, personalized recommendations? I love Nuzzle, actually. I mean, it's sort of sort of the meta. It's sort of the meta platform for if, you, if you're not on Nuzzle, just experience it and you'll fall in love with it instantly. 
It works. I mean, your data, I guess, while somewhat depressing, was you know, is also sort of represents the reality, which is people do want to see what they think. They want to see more of what they've liked in the past, and so uh, you know, this is this is what we're getting. And and you know, we talk about. I don't know. Do people even still use the expression filter bubble anymore? I think that that feels like a very kind of 2010 expression, but. But it's it's still very much real. I mean, you can you can see it in your own um, in your own feeds, and even on Twitter. Um, you know, except for those of us that go out of our way to make sure that our follow lists represent you know a wide variety of voices, uh, just by choosing the people that you know you follow, you're creating your own kind of filter bubble, even if it's not even if it's not um, intermediated by an algorithm. So um, you know, this is this is difficult for for news organizations. And um, it's not necessarily great for um, informed civic dialogue. I mean, I think we're seeing a lot of that play out this year in a very bifurcated um, uh, election year. Uh, but I see it only becoming more, more prevalent, not less so. I mean, Instagram has now gone to algorithm. Uh, you know, everybody's following that. Liz, um, you have an editorial team. You're the executive editor. Should it, you know, should we replace all that editing with just collaborative filtering and get on with it, or what's the value of, of the editing here, and, and how can you make it visible to people the value of the editing? I mean, for for us at Huffington Post, we think about our editorial value proposition as the sum total of what we're doing. So our relentless focus on certain topics. Um, you know, and, and we also program for audiences on a platform like Facebook. We have actually 79 Facebook pages, which is uh, pretty absurd. <laughs> uh, we have maybe 12 that are incredibly robust that we consider their own specific audiences, and we will often program for those audiences knowing that certain moments, certain pieces of coverage are really going to knock it out of the park, and, and th their ability to be knocked so far out of the park is largely due to the algorithm, right? Um, otherwise, they could like have a little blip and die. And you know, um, I actually think algorithmic filtering is not a bad user experience at all, and it allows certain pieces to have a much, much, much bigger life than they would ordinarily um, if, if there was nothing to kind of keep them going for a long time. Um, but we also think about, you know. Obviously, our front page, we're lucky enough to have a front page that people still come to a lot. Uh, we have some very loyal, direct users. Um, and I think part of that is because the Huffington Post has always had a front page that's very much a brand statement. Like, we're telling you as big as we possibly can, uh, this is what matters today to us, and it should matter to you as well. Uh, and we're experimenting with other ways to, to you know, put our editorial stamp and our editorial judgment on things that are a little bit more abstract than a front page. Uh, you know, we have a new product called Trump Cards that some of you may have seen, uh, which, is, which is a great experiment in this vein. You know, I mean, the way we're covering Donald Trump is maybe a little bit different than other media organizations. For a long time, we've known that this is not a normal candidate for president, that this is not politics as usual or business as usual, and we're covering him accordingly. Um, and, you know, uh, so we, we do a lot of aggregation. That's a huge part of our DNA at Huffington Post. And we created trump cards to be like the next level of aggregation. So we're looking at the best pieces out there, the most interesting, provocative, intellectual pieces on Donald Trump and, and his rise. Um, and we put them together in a really beautiful package that uh, has the ability to be socially distributed. Um, but it's also, you know, we, we are bringing our news judgment and our editorial uh, judgment to this product. So it's a way to get a little bit more abstract about the idea of editorial judgment and allow it to then flower into something that's a little bit more socially distributed. So, you know, I think it's not uh, an either or. Like, I think there is value in, it goes back to your identity as a news organization. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be like, here's what we put on our homepage or our front page or at the top of the hour. Um, you, can, you can express your editorial judgment in other ways and, and get kind of exciting and abstract about it, and we're, we're very keen to do that. Emily. I mean, I think it's kind of a fascinating question. I thought 22%, so your slide said 22% of people wanted stories recommended by their friends. That's an incredibly low number, given that the major filtering kind of proposition that we're told is relevant from Facebook is stories that your friends also liked. Actually, people don't want to see what their friends are in all cases. And I thought the other thing that was really interesting was how those figures, which were all pretty low, you didn't have anything over 35%. Um, so two things. I think there is just public general sort of confusion and a certain amount of... Um, just not really knowing when somebody says, do you want it to be 
recommended by an algorithm. You know, kind of you almost feel terrible saying, yes, actually, I'd love an algorithm to tell me what to read today. <laughs> Would you like it recommended by an editor? Yes, because editors are in infallible in all situations. <laughs> Would you like it recommended by your friends? No, thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and, and yet, kind of, so, so we talk very earnestly about how these things, is, and of course, collaborative filtering is actually a really great thing. Algorithms are a really great thing. You know, um, uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, really wouldn't be able to function without an, a, a very strong or, and, or, or completely automated component. But, the thing that was so interesting for me was just that sort of anxiety, uh, and it may dissipate and turn into nothing, but the anxiety of people saying, I worry that with all of these personalized systems, I might be missing out on something. Because the big shift here, which we haven't really talked about, we've talked about television and we've talked about, you know, how, so we forgot, actually we haven't talked about print because that's over. Um, but the big thing here is we're going into a kind of a post-broadcast society for news. And by post-broadcast, I mean just the certainty that everybody finds out about things more or less at the same time in the same way. And that's a huge shift in terms of civic impact for journalism. It's a big question for does it actually, do, you know, this, I think the age of the sort of author editor in a way is kind of already over this idea that you have because that can exist in your journalists. There is a, everybody that's very uncomfortable who's actually got an author editor because it's like, oh, or if you are one, because you're like, oh, no, 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 these things are all going to persist. But I think that it, just in those two slides, there's some really big questions because certainly how platforms are filtering isn't how people are saying that they want to receive their news. Um, and I think it sort of leads us into a whole sort of question about, you know, how does journalism make an impact? What do you do if you're an editor? And the reality of it is, if you look at our research, is that this kind of, you know, this convergence is really rapid, really, really rapid. So, you know, kind of, I don't know, there's a big question mark, I think, over the future of sort of editing um, in the way that we've thought about it in the past. I'm shocked by the suggestion that my search results and social feeds are not sort of lovingly hand-picked through artisanal <laughs> curation by Mark Zuckerberg but, but and Mary But we uh, did Page. have, I mean, it was hilarious, uh, wasn't it, when, when, when it's turned out that humans intervene uh, in the Facebook uh, algorithm and immediately it was like, what, there are humans um, <laughs> interfering in this? We must have a meeting at which Glenn Beck is the most <laughs> sane representative. <laughs> So that was, and, and, and then if you said, but, uh, you know, so, so, so if you, and then when you say, but the algorithms are picking everything, people are equally kind of surprised. And I think that, you know, the serious point here is that there is a level of sort of public education, which, uh, and journalistic education, which needs to go on about exactly what the hell is going on here, because it is really complicated. Edward, what do you make of this interplay between professional expertise and technology? Well, okay, can, um, just to, maybe this will sound a bit old school, but I think that, Algorithmic personalization is one of those things. There's nothing new about it. People have been talking about it for 15 years. And it's generally over-promised and under-delivered. So I think that would be the first point. And I point to a few examples of that. You know, the, uh, you know, the New York Times removing its recommendation engine because, it's, again, it's rejected by consumers. People actually found it quite irritating. Um, you know, Prismatic, you know, very, very hot company two, three years ago, completely vanished off the charts since then. So there's nothing new. And when you ask people the question, do you want personalized news, people say yes. When you hand it to them, they don't typically like it or they haven't liked the versions they've seen of it there. So that's just a reality check. I think the Facebook thing was interesting in that you know, people thought they were seeing something algorithmic and then it turns out it's not to be entirely algorithmic. So again, another sign of some of the problems there. On the social side, I'd point to a, a data point in your survey which showed that although 44% of people get news, consume news in some shape or form on Facebook, only 14% see social media as their primary destination for news, which I think is very encouraging. Um, and that, so what it, what it suggests is that a lot of people are scanning social media for news, but in addition to which, they, see, they still see the web as a primary source for news, the web or TV. Okay, can I, if you want a sort of perfect evidence of the confusion around all of these issues and all of these terms, look, if you have not, you must watch the Tronk video. That was out yesterday. Has everybody seen the Tronk video? If you have, you're laughing and shaking your head. If you haven't, as soon as you leave here, you need to go watch it. Because it is an incredible piece of performance art, really. 
that mashes all kinds of jargon together that basically about things being shoved into funnels and instead of algorithms now it's artificial intelligence it's going to change everything and at the end of the day we just need more video because that's where the money is it's really sort of just it's the perfect encapsulation of of this confusion both inside the industry and you know and by extension to platforms and audiences so how do, how do we short sell trunk yeah 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 <laughs> no, exactly um, I wonder whether this is maybe sort of the question of, of I, I try to suggest this in my in my gloss on the on the data and the report here is the question is there is there a, a market opportunity and a journalistic opportunity in trying to um, tell the story of the value of professional expertise and editing here I mean um, I think I think Emily is very right to highlight that actually. Um, the majority of our respondents are not particularly content with any kind of sort of filtering information online, only they happen to like the idea of personalized recommendations, perhaps less the reality of it, as Edward points out. The idea of personalized recommendations, they like that more than some of the other options uh, out there, it seems. Is there um, an opportunity here uh, to try to um, think about what journalism is and how it is done, but also perhaps think about how one can um, convince more people to appreciate the value of at least great journalism? I think, I think that's, a, that's a great question. And I, and I think one of the challenges for traditional publishers is that they're fundamentally they're, they're, they're run by journalists often, and it's about the journalism. They're not marketing companies, and that, that marketing skill set isn't as central as it might be for a consumer products company, so for example. So I think back to a theme that we were discussing earlier is, you know, how do you make your brand something that's, and your journalism something that's recognized as being differentiated and distinguished? Uh, and I don't think, uh, being honest about it, that um, any of the conventional brands are doing a particularly great job of that just yet. And I think it's absolutely critical, you know, in a very crowded market to be extremely clear what your value proposition is and uh, persuade people of that proposition. Liz, Muse? This is a tough one. You know, I just, over my years of experience in news, trying to pull back the curtain on journalism is something that journalists always think is going to be really exciting for the audience, <laughs> and it never is. <laughs> like, it's not as exciting as we think it is. I mean, it's, it's fun to live, less exciting to watch and, and, and understand. Um, so, you know, I, I don't, talk, speaking about, I think you're 100% right that the marketing skill set is not necessarily what, what we're great at in newsrooms, um, which is fine. It's not our core competency. Um, but, uh, but I don't know if that would do it, to pull, pull back the curtain as much. Um, I do think it's very worthwhile to pull back that curtain with the platforms that you're working with, um, who are benefiting from all the work that we do, which is very expensive, very hard, uh, requires the skills that they don't have. And I think actually this year, you know, last year was the year that I think the media really woke up to the fact that we're living in a platform age in terms of the audiences and the value that we're getting um, as, as publishers. And this year is the year that I think some of us are starting to educate or try to educate the, the platforms about what it takes to do what we do. Um, and they really strongly encourage them to take that into account in, in terms of their goals and what they're trying to accomplish. Um, and that's an ongoing conversation that I think it's very worthwhile having. I mean, well, one word, spotlight, uh, obviously, um, which um, makes, so this idea that sort of journalism needs to uh, communicate its value. I mean, there is a kind of an interesting shift which is going on, which is, as I say, about the personal and how voice uh, of individual journalists, you know, that there's a, there's a bigger question here about what our publishers going to be left doing. So, you know, um, it's not impossible to imagine a world where differentiation is, are you a kind of studio system where a certain type of journalist wants to work and how much do you allow them to be fully transparent uh, or opaque about their process. We may be some way from that, maybe it's never going to happen. But if you look at the rising power of platforms, then the question about what our news organisation is left with is a really big one because, you know, kind of at the moment, you have to say sort of, you know, distribution and advertising is, is, is going really well for the platforms and it's not going really well for the publishers. Actually, publisher, you know, publishing news is a classification of activity which is being taken away from the people who, who, who did it previously. 
Um, so I do think that sort of, you know, how can we demonstrate our values is, Liz's point is absolutely right, which is you kind of have to get the platforms to really value what you do and then in some way deliver value back to you. And that's not going to happen, I don't think, um, or it's not going to happen at the scale at which it would have want, you know, it, it, at the scale at which we used to operate it. So this is, I don't like, like to sound, you know, all doomy. Actually, I, lo I love sounding doomy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a skill. Uh, but I do think that, I, but I do think that that's a, that's a, that's a sort, of, sort of key question, really, in a way, which, you know, um, unless platforms are going to return more money at some point to the journalistic process, a lot of journalism is going to stop happening. If anyone has an idea on how to monetize pessimism, you know, yeah. speak to Emily after um, uh, in the break. <laughs> I, maybe this is the moment where we should sort of dwell a, for a moment on the sort of the slightly uncomfortable, pretty pretty central question of money. Um, so I'm just going to sort of, as the one who doesn't have sort of shareholders or employers, uh, employees uh, depending on it, maybe I can lay out just a few observations. Um, mobile advertising clearly is very tough. Um, ad blocking is only going to make that harder. Um, the ability of a limited number of players to offer very cheap, very effectively targeted, uh, very high conversion digital advertising is very, very hard to compete with. Um, some brands are building a subscription base uh, or in a few cases attempting to build a membership base. Um, and um, it's worked a lot better than a lot of commentators suggested, which is uh, important and interesting to remember. Um, but m I think many brands do not feel they are quite where they want it to be. Um, a range of other supplementary forms of income uh, have been floated, experimented with. Some of them have delivered some returns, but um, not always to the extent that perhaps their evangelists would have suggested. Um, what should we make of this? Um, is this just the world in which we live, um, and it's just a question of getting on with it, or are there reasons for optimism that are not visible uh, to outside observers? Um, Edward? Yeah, sure. I mean, so just uh, at the risk of competing with Emily on the gloomometer, um, uh, yeah, Facebook, uh, Facebook booked uh, $5.2 billion of advertising revenue in the first quarter of this year, uh, which is more than the entire advertising revenues of the U.S. newspaper industry. So just as a moment in time, if you're, if you're, if you're trying to figure out where the money is going, you know, then it, it, it's pretty obvious. Um, you know, Facebook is, uh, is, is being incredibly successful in terms of uh, hoovering it up. You know, I mean, I think you know, for us, it's about the subscription model. Um, it's really as simple as that. You know, we have 893,000 uh, digital subscribers to the Wall Street Journal. That number's growing, uh, and it's a growth business. I mean, it, with with that model, the merit of that, if you like, rather simple model, um, is that you know, mobile accelerates it. You know, the more you know, the more people we can persuade to um, access the Wall Street Journal on mobile, the better. Because with a with a smartphone, they're likely to carry that with them throughout the course of the day, and therefore you've got that deeper engagement with the reader, even more so than with the desktop consumer or the tablet consumer. So I think for us, um, you know, if you look at the confluence of you know the difficulties in uh, the advertising market, particularly on mobile with ad blockers, um, you know, the, the the difficulties which I think we've masked for too long around video and you know making video work well for publishers, um, it really points to. Uh, the essential nature, at least for us, of making the subscription model work? The problem with the sus subscription model um, is that it's only going to work for a few news organizations. I mean, it's fine for the, yes, great for the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the Washington Post is, I don't know if you, anybody's noticed, but that wall has gotten much, much thicker just in the last six weeks or so. You know, the Guardian's going to start looking at membership or some form. Beyond that, boy, I, I'm hard pressed to think who else, other than like specialty niche publications, are really going to be able to, to derive uh, a, a lot of revenue. You know, um, I mean, that comes back again to why video, at least, you know, milk it while it's there, it probably will collapse. We didn't really talk <laughs> in your report, as CPMs, I mean, sorry, yeah. but it will, it, because they yeah. only made the yeah. point about yes. volume. Uh, and we're all like so cheery. You know, your report doesn't, doesn't deal, uh, doesn't really address, I think, one other form of revenue that a lot of news organizations are dabbling with, which is branded content, mm -hmm. which, you know, is a, is a mixed bag. I mean, it is, you, you sort of, you can follow the, the logic process, which is, oh, we know how to tell stories, we've got newsrooms, we've got all these tools, we can make videos, we can do infographics, we all, why don't we use those very same school tools on behalf of brands um, the brands will pay us, we'll tell stories. Yes, we'll carefully label it, all that. I'm not 
really that concerned about that. I mean, there's some bad actors, but you know, mostly you know, good good actors in this in terms of and 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 make money that way. And I and I think you know, a lot of organizations have jumped on the bandwagon, and I, and it seems to be promising. And I've encouraged news organizations or anybody that I talk to to try it. But I again, I I think there's sort of a, a, a too much optimism that this again is everybody's looking for some kind of you know savior revenue savior and in the end it's going to be you know bits and pieces of everything i think that's a, such a key part and also you know a lot of what we talked about here is is about the convergence of technology and journalism you know the tech industry um has completely won the advertising uh, the display you know increasingly the display advertising game and 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 the um, search advertising game a long time ago. That's sort of gone. I didn't, you know, I didn't think um, that uh, advertising revenues for publishers were going to collapse in the spectacular way they have because I think it was very hard for people to know exactly what was going to happen with mobile. I don't think ad blockers were really kind of, you know, anticipated. I think, you know, Viv is right that um, we see sponsored content ri rising, you know, it's sort of 25% now of sort of the digital advertising market, which is, which is significant. And I think part of that is publishers saying, we can actually disrupt the agency business. So I, I, I think you're right when you say these are the components they already have, but I think they're also saying, where can we move in the value chain that disrupts this? Um, things we haven't talked about, not-for-profit. Um, you know, kind of uh, the American market is not very comfortable with not-for-profit news. Um, uh, I, I get sick of saying, I remember, I'm not that old, but I remember when ProPublica launched and literally nobody thought it would work. And they all said there's a ridiculous idea. The, I mean, the other thing is that you can't talk about money without sort of talking about scale. And I think just this expectation that revenues and newsrooms are going to be the same size has surely nobody believes that now that you know we're, you can do brilliant journalism now on a much 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 smaller cost basis so you know Evan Smith does amazing work at the Texas Tribune three million dollars a year you know Dick Tofel's team at ProPublica 13 million dollars a year you know these are tiny figures for big publishers and I think that's you know that's what you have to look at which is exactly as Vivian says a mixed revenue bag, but also much, much, much smaller scale. If I just pick up on that theme very quickly, I think that's a great point, which is, you know, we always presuppose that we're looking for revenue to cover the existing cost bases, but, you know, there's, there's some fantastic young entrepreneurs that are coming through with, you know, great news companies. I mean, a former colleague of ours, Jessica Lesson, has launched something called The Information. I pay $320 a year for it. It's a, it's, it, yes, it's a niche service. Yes, it's really focused on technology. But there's, there's no advertising. It's great journalism. It's very well executed. They don't write too much, which is a relief. Um, you know, politi <laughs> Politico, you know, uh, we, we all take for granted that Politico is this you know, biggish organization now. But, you know, 10 years ago, it didn't exist. Uh, it's a very diverse and successful organization with a, with a mixture, to, to um, Vivian's point, with a mixture of, of, of revenue streams ranging from subscription for its newsletters to advertising to print um, to online. So. You know, the, 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 there's, the, it, it isn't all doom and gloom. There's a lot of entrepreneurs that are coming through now and taking advantage to Emily's point of the lowest cost basis that you can get away with now to create successful businesses. I'll just, I'm probably the token optimist <laughs> on the panel when it comes to this. Um, and I'm also not on the business side, which, which probably helps me be more optimistic. But um, I, I will say that native advertising was not a thing that we thought as an industry would work a few years ago, and it's working very, very well as a, as a new source of revenue. Um, subscriptions also, people uh, poo-pooed quite a bit, and it's working for some publishers very, very well, including Politico has Politico Pro, and there's some um, digital scale publications that are doing more niche paid coverage, um, which is interesting. So, you know, I, I'm optimistic and pragmatic that uh, the media industry writ large will find a way to tell stories and to get good information to people. Um, there may be a lot of media companies that don't make it through this time of change, and certainly a lot of us will be operating at a different scale, as Emily was saying. Um, but the optimistic way to look at how much this has changed our business uh, for the worse is it's also made it a lot easier to um, for anybody, any news organization, to, to do some pretty amazing work with this and a GoPro and, um, and get it to millions and millions of people, which is not nothing. I mean, I will just say, if you will, completely unscientifically and anecdotally as a user, it's very hard for me to imagine that I would want to go back to the late 90s. I mean, 
Uh, I wouldn't want to live without my smartphone. I wouldn't want to live without search and social. Um, and I frankly think that the best journalism today, again, this is completely unscientific, it's better than it's ever been. Uh, I mean, the information available about the Paris climate change negotiations, I cannot see that one can construct a credible argument that we were better informed about Kyoto in the 90s. I mean, I just don't see you can make that argument. It's clear that there are real, real issues, local, regional uh, areas of expertise, uh, and that there are real issues here. But I mean, I, I don't want to come across as sort of doom and gloom. I think there are real reasons for optimism. And again, it is worth reminding uh, ourselves that even if the publishing industry feels the pain very keenly, it is in part um, because others have been better at solving problems that actual uh, people out in the world uh, experience. So that, I think, is probably what several of you have said that you are striving to do better in the future, and that's probably where, where people need to go. Um, we have been um, talking a, a lot, uh, and we really want to hear now from people in the room um, questions uh, to any of the panelists, or if you have any questions about the report, uh, I'm particularly pleased to take those. So if you can raise your hand, and there is a mic uh, in, the, in the middle of the L here, and if you can just please very briefly say who you are when you ask the question and who the question is for. So the gentleman here in the front row. Um, my name is David Charamadori. I work at The Guardian in New York. Um, Emily, you said that uh, there would be less journalism overall, but I think people will still want to consume journalism. Um, so is it not inevitable then that platforms start to provide it? Um, because why wouldn't they want to be in charge end to end, ultimately? And what would that look like? Well, David, as you know, um, <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> the great thing about being in journalism is that you get to work with lots of journalists and sometimes you get to manage them. And the tech industry has found out what that's like and they've decided they don't really want to do it. So, um, I mean, sorry, that's a very facile way of actually a asking what I think is a, going to be an increasingly pressing question. And... Uh, so, so, so first of all, you know, if you look at Amazon, um, Jeff Bezos is making a play at the moment saying, I can turn a news company into a really sort of um, properly digitized uh, production house that will, you know, distribute great journalism everywhere and will use every model to, to, to do it. And I don't mind funding that for some time. I mean, it's, you know, it's so, so complex to unpick what's happening at the moment that we forget that one of the things that's really hampering the news industry is, you know, lack of access to capital. If you have any news organisation which is, you know, tied to the ball and chain of print, then try getting Wall Street to lend you any money. You know, if you go in saying, uh, don't mention the journalism word, but you go in to try and raise money for, you know, an exciting new uh, content startup, you're much more likely to get, you know, to get money to kind of fund innovation. Tech companies don't show. Liz would know this better than I do, show a lot of desire to manage newsrooms. But, and this is the important thing, which is um, some of our research after the break will show that, you know, we're on a trajectory now where that's not an impossible scenario. Um, and I don't, I think it's happened so quickly that I don't think tech companies really know what they think about it. Um, and I think that sort of journalism companies that are half thinking that would be awful because there's a real sort of cultural divide and they're half thinking this is the, you know, maybe this is, the, maybe this is the only chance we have to play in that at, at the scale that we used to. But I'd be, I'd be interested as Liz has recent and Vivian have both recently worked in the tech industry. They will know I merely speculate. I will say that the tech industry is nothing if not confident about their ability to do things better <laughs> uh, than any existing uh, system that we have. And I wouldn't, you know, it's not surprising that they look at news and they see that it's something that is drives a lot of interaction and engagement on their platforms and they think they can do it better, you know, and you'd see, I mean, there was a rumor, I don't know if this is true, maybe Vivian knows that Twitter wanted to buy Mike um, at some point, you know, obviously we've all heard about uh, the Facebook news team and, and how they were uh, involved in the trending uh, algorithm and the, and the trending display, you know, I would say Snapchat in a way with Discover is managing newsrooms, <laughs> uh, you know, they are programming Discover and, and there are people at every newsroom, um, not every, but many newsrooms who are, you know, in some ways working for very editorial-minded uh, people at Snapchat. So 
So, you know, it's not out of the, out of the realm of possibility. Um, I also think that with the changing relationship between the media and platforms, you know, now they are paying for some kind of content, which is both a positive thing because they recognize that it has value and it's expensive to produce uh, and takes skill, but it's also a very new wrinkle in our relationship with platforms. Um, and uh, so it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. I'll only add, because I think I agree with much of what you've said, is that it is impossible to underestimate or overestimate the difference in culture between a tech company and any news organization, any, I mean legacy, television, print, digital, are at least all in the same, are at least sort of in the Milky Way, um, even if they're very different. Tech companies are in a galaxy far, far beyond. It's, it's called California. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <Cold> California. <laughs> that may be part of it. But they're also, I mean, it's, it's all, we shouldn't dismiss the way they think about it either. Like, I, like again, it goes back to how we at the Huffington Post look at the, it's a relationship, it's a co yeah. collaboration. Um, you know, they, it's worthwhile to ask yourself to stop, take a big step back and say, is this the right way to do this anymore? You know, and, and they have the ability to, you know, they have the capital and they have the ability because they're new to this game to try it in different ways. And it's I, not a bad and thing. And I do say. think that there is something in this idea that if you want to be a successful news organization, you have to cultivate a really close relationship and, and, and increasingly so in the future with, you know, what we think of now as platform companies. Yeah. And I think that that's, you know, we kind of laughed a bit. I remember um, speaking to somebody in Silicon Valley who was a CEO of a former CEO of a tech company. Um, just after Jeff Bezos had bought the Washington Post, and he was like, God, why does he want to do that? That's the wrong thing to do. And I was saying, well, you know, kind of actually what he will find is that most of the coverage of what he does is now tied to a tiny, tiny percentage of <laughs> what he owns, and he'll either love that or in a Chris Hughes fashion with the New Republic really hate it. Um, but it's, but that, it, you know, the, the kind of, that kind of relationship is going to force the question within tech companies as well, which is, hey, maybe it's quite cool to be tied to doing pioneering great journalism. You know, when J Jason Resign was let out of jail, Jeff Bezos went to fetch him home personally. It's a, that is something that, you know, kind of, you know, the showbiz of journalism, if you like, is kind of, you know, has always been irresistible to extremely rich people. And so. extremely rich people <laughs> now live in significant numbers in Silicon Valley, um, and they come from the engineering industry. So, welcome to the benign billionaires. There is a question in the third row here. Yes, yes. Um, my name is Perul. I'm from Forbes. This is very tall. Um, I have a two-part question. Um, the first is for Edward, and it has to do with uh, the Wall Street Journal subscriptions. So, I personally subscribe to a lot of newspapers, but I don't read them on my phone. I don't log into the New York Times app on my phone to read it. If I want to read the New York Times, I'll go to my desktop. So as mobile grows, how are subscribers going to access, I guess, the Wall Street Journal? Do you, how do you see that happening? You know, it could be a combination of the web and apps. You know, and I think you know the the the, the short answer, and, and 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 don't think this glib is that the products need to get better. Um, I think that um, you know the, the, we see the web and apps slightly differently. The web is the, the mobile web is fantastic for achieving scale. You can you know achieve ten times the scale or the reach of the people than you can by apps. Um, and apps is really there for engagement. So what we see in our own data is that at the moment that a subscriber downloads and starts using an app, the probability of them churning is significantly reduced. So I think from our point of view, it's about you know, putting people in through the web to our uh, news, and then ultimately trying to persuade them to download an app and become regular users. Is that an easy thing to do? Absolutely not. And we all know the issues in terms of you know, the large number of apps that people have on their phones. But what the data does show is when you get to that point, uh, the churn rates drop off dramatically, and you've got a much lo uh, greater chance of um, keeping people as a subscriber. Then I have a general question just about, we didn't really talk about Blendle or other s similar services. So I'm just curious what anyone's thoughts are on that type of service. We're experimenting with it. Um, it's a little premature to um, say what the results are. But I think that, you know, we're, we're, I mean, as somebody who is in the paid model, um, we are open to anything that gives customers uh, different options in terms of accessing the content. So uh, if we can make that work, we'll use it. 
I mean, I can maybe add to that that um, I think it's clear that subscription has to be a bigger part of the business for at least many brands if, if there is to be a sustainable bis basis for, for journalism looking forward. So I think we should applaud every experiment in that space. Uh, I think Blendle is trying to solve uh, a couple of different problems. One is the poor user experience uh, of many u news sites. I think their app is, is trying to be better than that. Um, one is sort of the question of sort of the frictions of payments. If you have to sort of pull out your credit card every time you want to buy something from a different source, that's unlikely to happen, to put it mildly, just in terms of the transaction costs of time and effort, which we know for a fact turns off a lot of people. So I think that's encouraging. And it's clear that this is one of the reasons why a couple of different legacy companies have been quite interested in this, Excel Springer, New York Times, and others. Um, I have to say that um, I think there is a lot um, that rests in the question of what is a micropayment. Um, if people are uh, disinclined to pay a dollar for uh, 250 stories from the New York Times today, you know, the story that you try to charge sort of 59 cents for has to be a pretty good story uh, before that's a clear sort of uh, value proposition. I think there is a real issue, what does a micropayment look like? And I think the micro here is a whole lot smaller uh, than what publishers are currently looking at. But Ultimately, that's a, the data, that's a data question, and I think Blendl and others are really looking at, at that question. How can you fit the demand curve more effectively uh, when you get above the uh, uncomfortable price point of zero? And I think Apple is doing some very interesting experiments in that field as well. Um, so whether it's Apple or Blendl, um, I think someone will crack it. And I'll, I'll just add, I mean, they're, they're not alone. I mean, there are many people are working on this. It's interesting to see in, in Europe, there are a couple of different companies that are working on one-click pay systems like uh, Dagens Nyheter in Sweden, and they say they've seen significant upticks. I think there are questions about um, whether paying for content, either subscription or one-off payments, can be integrated into other environments, e-commerce, social, or the like, and whether there is a question for that. We see in India, for example, uh, Daily Hunt providing an environment for that, and there are, there are many different players working in this, uh, this space. Hi, my name is Nadia Hu. I'm a foreign correspondent. I write in Chinese. Um, my question is, where do you see the media censorship policy in China? And I have a second question. Uh, in, for now and in the future, how do you see the opportunity or barriers to engage this multilingual, multicultural, global audience? Maybe one of the, uh, maybe Liz or Edward, I mean, you both work in news organizations that are probably also trying to serve mainland China. I mean, how do you experience that? Um, well, I, to be honest, I'm not particularly optimistic um, uh, about China. I mean, our, our, we had a Chinese language website that was uh, shut down um, after the 20th anniversary of Tiananmen Square. Um, and um, it's, you know, things have got tougher since then. Um, so, um, you know, we, we have a large presence and we cover China um, uh, in, in great depth. Uh, but there's a difference between cover it, coverage of China and operating a business in China. And I think we're having to you know, start again, really, and think afresh about it. But that's where we are. We're in a similar boat, although we didn't have a, you know, a, a site that was shut down. But um, you know, I, I think it's so important to, I would like to engage with, with that audience very much. Uh, you know, we haven't really talked about the Huffington Post international strategy, but um, it did come up in Rasmus's presentation. Uh, this to me is also one of the m things that makes me the most optimistic about the potential for the news business is international expansion, expansion for a U.S. brand. Um, and China would be a fantastic place for us to work more closely with. Um, you know, we do have a relationship with some of the social platforms there that we're experimenting with, uh, which is where a lot of the conversation takes place. Um, but yeah, it's, it's difficult to, to break in and very complex, but something that we definitely have our eye on. It does feel as though it's something which actually, where actually the relationship with the platforms is absolutely critical um, because, you know, inter and, and your excellent question about how do you address uh, broad international audiences, etc. There is a kind of a, a real upside to the platform economy for news in that. And there's also a kind of a downside as well, which often goes unacknowledged, which is a very, it's totally sort of Amerocentric. Uh, you know, we're at, the world is being... Um, uh, if you like, sort of trained in 
American standards of free speech, which can be a hugely beneficial thing, and then in certain areas of the world is, is, is not actually seen as a hugely beneficial thing either. And I think these are kind of, you know, huge issues that we could have and should have completely sort of, you know, separate research, you know, conferences, action on. But, but really the sort of, the, I think the, the, the point about how do we, you know, how does one see censorship and free speech, I think unless you have the major platform companies really standing behind that, um, you know, it's going to be a sort of an extra, to, to me it feels like it's going to be more extraterritorial rather than a sort of a, you know, kind of a BBC versus a, you know, it will be a Google, Facebook kind of issue, I think, probably. There's a gentleman in the fourth row here and then the lady in the blue afterwards, so, please. Uh, hi, my name is David Marnie and I'm the CEO of a company called GoSub. Um, I've actually met with Edward before um, and also Vivian at one of the Daily News um, uh, seminars. Um, our company used to be called Newspaper. Um, we are one of the companies that's actually trying to do what Blendle does, which is to make it easier for people to pay for news. I happen to, um, excuse the pun, subscribe to the philosophy that people ultimately, for publishers to succeed, money has to come out of a user's bank account and into their bank account ultimately because of the dire condition of online economics. Um, I've come from an online ad background. Um, my question is generally, um, it wasn't dealt with in the study, um, the friction you mentioned around payments. Um, to me, that's the big elephant in the room. Uh, if you literally asked people to, before they walked into every bar <coughs> and restaurant and cafe, that they had to fill out a form and sign up before they were allowed to go in. And then when they went back to an, the same place they already signed up to, they had to give a username and password. They'd just flag it. They would say, oh, I don't want to do that. That's too much of a hassle. Yet somehow we expect that people are going to do that in the online content business. And they're just not going to do that. It's too much of a pain. Um, we've built a system where you can subscribe with a click and access, uh, and you can unsubscribe with a click, access is password free. Um, I'm just wondering what you all think about this kind of issue of friction, getting people to give you money. Well, so, I mean, I you know, am famously tied to the free strategy at The Guardian. One of the reasons was that when we were looking at it, well, two reasons actually, one of which is I do think that there is an interesting issue around should everybody pay for news at the point of consumption? Because the natural end of that argument says certain people will have access to better quality information than other people can't, and it will be determined on ability to pay. And I don't think that we want that for any society, actually. So there is a, there is a civic question there as well, which is a, being an academic, you have to raise civic questions. Um, the friction question is absolutely on point, which is when you looked at the cost of building and maintaining paywalls and the friction created in those systems, you know, 15 years ago, the, 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 you know, I remember the journals like heavy lifting in that was enormous and it was hugely costly. And even when the New York Times did it kind of like six years ago with a, with a more porous uh, paywall, it was still a significant cost. You know, all of this is going to be, I think, solved by a Google or, again, uh, th this is where that relationship with platforms does have some, some upsides to it. You know, Google, which has always been pretty religiously sort of against the idea that anything can, can be paid for, I think we'll see them have a change of heart in terms of developing frictionless payment mechanisms. You know, we pay for data, we pay for all sorts of things on our phones that we don't really think about. Um, if we can get people to opt into that system, then I think, you know, I actually feel way more optimistic about subscription than I did 10 years ago, because everything you say about friction then was right, and friction is only coming down in every system. I want to just make a point about, you started by talking about, you, you fundamentally believe, I think you said this, that people want to understand that this is how news organizations need to survive. There is perhaps in this country, arguably, no more loyal audience to a news organization than NPR listeners. And people are rabid about NPR. The reason they have those tote bags and hats is because they feel like they're a member of a society. NPR is very, very sophisticated after many decades of trying to get people to give them money and makes it very, very easy. It's not completely frictionless, but very easy. And uh, year after year after year, and I don't know what the recent data is, but I wouldn't be surprised. I'd be surprised if it has changed. No more than then 10 to 12, 13, 14 percent of loyal listeners actually give to, give to their local NPR station. It's very tough. There just sort of seems to be this natural barrier that we see throughout many organizations in the low double digits. Um, 
There is a, the next question is from the lady in the blue. Um, I have three people who have indicated that they want to ask a question. Uh, if other people have questions they want to ask, if you could please give an indication now, and I will try to ensure that we cover everything uh, before we wrap up for the break. So, okay, I have another uh, fourth question, so please. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ehidamet. I'm from Nigeria, but a recent graduate of Columbia Journalism School. So my question is around citizen journalism. I'm curious to know what um, attention we should be paying to the rise of um, increased mobile penetration and the newsroom using it as a source of engagement for the people because I feel a lot of discussion that has been around these days is how Facebook is succeeding, having the people because they are bet better at engaging the audience, turning them from just mere consumers into producers as well. So what should we as journalists be looking at the newsroom, the newsroom investments, what should they be paying attention to? I mean, I can maybe speak to this uh, briefly. This is, lies a little bit beyond the research in this particular report, but I'm very happy that you raised this issue because I think it's one of the things that uh, news organizations have to be thinking about, and, and The Guardian in the UK has been one of the leaders in thinking about this, is uh, how can one uh, unleash uh, other motivations or powers to generate uh, journalistic uh, coverage, right? How can you connect with communities who may have motivations to try to contribute to coverage, to do their own coverage, and how can you communicate that in a way that strikes a balance between the um, often and entirely understandable, uh, understandably and legitimately sort of uh, advocacy-oriented motivations that citizen journalists often have. They want to change the world, often in a way that may come across to traditional journalists as quite partisan or quite sort of activist. Uh, between that and then uh, journalistic norms, uh, which of course are different in different countries, but normally include some um, commitment to the idea of sort of finding truth and reporting it, uh, of hearing relevant views on an issue, some degree of, of, of uh, due impartiality. Uh, I would also add to it, though, that I think that um, I realize that, that there are really encouraging and impressive examples of citizen journalism in some parts of the world, but um, that the record overall, I think, has illustrated quite vividly uh, how difficult and hard it is to do great journalism, um, and how um, unlikely it is that, and at, at a general level, that uh, volunteers uh, will uh, sort of magically uh, do this in a way that can be directly compared to what professional journalists uh, aspire to do, and in some cases do. I mean. uh, we did do some research on this a couple of years ago, actually Dr. Wardle, our research director at the back, uh, and Pete Brown, they looked at uh, broadcast networks actually largely in Europe, um, and just demonstrated that uh, you know, without fail on every single broadcast there is a, now a high component of what we would call user-generated content, awful phrase, Dr. Wardle would call it um, eyewitness media. Uh, I tell you what does well on video, Chewbacca Mom does well on video. Um, I tell you what every newsroom has installed in it now, data miner, which is surfacing and work. So, I mean, the idea of, oh, is it happening? How should we work with it? It's actually happened. Um, and in the breaking context, in the, in the context of breaking news now, breaking news is, you know, just sort of, you just have to look at any breaking story to know that, uh, witness witnesses are non-professional witnesses are absolutely at the heart of any of that you know look at Orlando you, interestingly kind of video actually taken for snapchat was some of the only footage we saw in a club question again Dr. Wald is the expert not me on this one how do newsrooms work with that responsibly how do platforms figure out what the um, protocols are for working with audiences because I don't think it's about you know, I, we, we tried hard to create sort of communities at the Guardian, we did quite well, um, but actually the communities are out there already, uh, and so are the individuals. And I think that the skill of how you synthesize that responsibly and ethically is one of the top sort of three things that every news organization has to be able to do now. I'm gonna move us on to make sure we cover the questions that are left, so here in the front. Hi, I'm Kate. I'm from the New York Times with this question that's a little leading, does not reflect opinions of my leadership, just <laughs> say that first. So it's really for Edward. Um, I was wondering if you could collaborate on your Apple News strategy about being top of the funnel. Do you think of Apple, New use, Apple News users as really complementary or a distinct user base from, your, from the users that actually go to your own and operated um, site? And are you concerned that you'll be habituating these users to Apple News, where Apple really controls the data, the direct relationship, 
and the monetization hooks? Is this really just a game for publishers chasing scale? So I mean, I make a broad point, then I'll uh, come to the, ne the narrow point up on you. So I think, in general, for us, and it is, comes back to the partnerships discussion, it's about uh, partners with whom we can have a dialogue, um, and and that really does, you know, the, the, the sudden. Uh, the sudden platforms that will just tell you this is what they'll do for you and that's it. You either take it or leave it. And there's others in with whom we can have a dialogue. We do have a dialogue um, uh, with Apple, I think, as an industry. And, and I do think that Apple's got a, a lot better at listening. And uh, as evidence of that, I'd point to the fact that they're introducing sort of payment methods within Apple News, which I think will be uh, beneficial to us and, for that matter, to, to, to the New York Times. Um, in terms of, um, you know, are we wholly satisfied? No, not yet. I think that what um, all publishers would wish uh, from Apple is more data. Uh, in other words, have a, a better knowledge of who, it, who, the, who the end reader is um, and, and information on those individuals. Um, on the other hand, if it's a new way of reaching an audience that we struggle to reach, we're very open to it, and hence we are on Apple News, and we see that relationship um, deepening. But we see it deepening insofar as it'll complement our existing which is ultimately to build a subscription base, and hence the introduction of that uh, payment mechanism is incredibly important to us. But you know, the other thing I'd flag with Apple News is it's very new. It's less than a year old. It's going to evolve significantly. We don't see it as a substitute to our existing apps. We see it as additive and hopefully a way of introducing new people to that ecosystem. But equally, we'll see how it evolves. In the end of the day, from our point of view, it needs to work for our strategy. My good friend with the extraordinarily stylish glasses at the back of the room. Thank you, Rasmus. <laughs> uh, Chris Anderson, City University of New York. Um, so we heard again uh, that the bar for having a successful subscription-based news organization is very high. Only a few news organizations will succeed. Um, I think this is a truism by this point. So my question is, why? Is it a supply problem with the content that's being produced by most news organizations, a demand problem, i.e. people are stupid or they don't want our stuff, or is it a structural problem uh, that goes beyond supply and demand? Um, and Rasmus, is there any data in the report or other reports you've done that shed light on this? Thank you. Can, can, I, can I just kick off very quickly with that? So first of all, I think what the data showed is that 9% you know, of people in the US are prepared to pay for news, as things currently stand now. So that equates to you know, more than two, uh, if you take that is just adults, that's, that equates to 20 million adults, more or less, more than 20 million adults. So it's not an insignificant market size. But the second thing is I think we need to challenge the view that most people won't pay for news. I think Spotify just put out some numbers today or yesterday that showed that they have you know, 30 million paying subscribers. That's one company with 30 million paying subscribers. If you'd ask people 10, 15 years ago, will you pay for music in you know, 2016? Many people have said, absolutely not. There is no pay model. So I think we need to challenge the assumption that there isn't pay models out there. And again, I'd point to the example I cited uh, earlier of a colleague of mine, Jessica Lesson, who, with, uh, who set up her own business. Um, it, it's a growing business. If you look at her website now, she's hiring journalists. She's expanding. So I think a lot of it is in the execution and to a point that David made earlier, you know, moving some of the friction points in terms of payments. But I think we should challenge the assumption that people won't pay for news, uh, provided it's differentiated and distinguished. Yeah, I mean, I guess my question wasn't, or my point wasn't that people won't pay for news, it's that they won't pay, it seems, for Trunk. <laughs> well, that's kind of a problem for Trunk, but maybe that's not a bad thing. I mean, if there is a shakeout, um, that, that is not necessarily a terrible thing, though that may, of course, is very tough for the people who work at what used to be called Tribune Publishing. Um, <laughs> And, and the communities that are served by, by often very impressive uh, local newspapers trying to do great journalism in a very tough situation uh, under now the umbrella of Trunk. Um, I guess uh, I am cautiously optimistic um, that as more and more publishers move from uh, operating with a mindset of being a in a scarcity situation and controlling the distribution system to understanding that you have to create value by differentiating what you're doing and moving up the value chain that, that you can convince more and more people to pay and that also as more and more people operate in an environment where we are probably, I think, and this will sort of betray my age, are probably a little bit less adverse to paying for digital content and services than perhaps uh, people like myself who grew up with sort of 20 years of the idea that almost everything you did online was free. Emily is making faces, and I can see why you'll be making these faces. I would say that one really striking thing for us 
uh, when we look at the reported um, at the figures of the number of people who say they pay for digital news uh, in our report across the country we cover, there is no age bias here. Younger people are not less likely to pay. Um, that's quite uh, interesting and quite encouraging and m I guess my hypothesis would be, and we're trying to do more in-depth analysis around this, is in part it's about the reference price. If you are accustomed to paying a little, a little, at least a little bit for a few of the apps that you use because you really think they make your everyday life better, then the step to also doing so for a good news, whether it's an aggregator or a blendle or, or a particular brand, is, is not a big, as big a jump. Uh, as it might have been um, otherwise, but it is, as, as all the panelists have said about uh, a adding value here. I would say, I'm, I mean, I suppose the, the almost the bigger, almost sort of cosmic question that's hard to get at is the, the how do you get from where news seems to be right now as something that everybody uses but nobody pays for to being more like hard to know, and it's very, very complicated. There is a massive oversupply issue in news, and if we don't say that, um, you know, uh, it's, it's not in the interest necessarily of journalism schools to go massive oversupply of news or indeed anyone on this pa panel, but that's the truth of it. And, you know, there always will be, while you will get venture capitalists to put money into new, viral, free, open uh, organisations that then start doing more and more of what the New York Times does, um, y it will still be the case when you then have broadcasters um, and cable companies and tele telephone companies investing in startups which are all free and they're following scale. Um, it will still be the case when you have rich people who will pay a lot of money to own and stand next to news and journalists but they don't need to see a return on investment. And where you have markets like, you know, with things like the BBC, which is an incredibly strong brand in its own market, which is not going to start charging people directly anytime soon, because at the moment it has the force of law to take 150 quid off people every, every year. So I think that sort of, you know, it's really hard to say why people won't pay for news. I mean, I think kind of we just haven't made it easy enough for them to stop themselves paying for news in a way. You know, we, as I say, we pay for all sorts of things we're not really aware that we're paying. And that to me is, you know, kind of that has been the secret of the BBC. Uh, it's got to be the secret at some point of, of paying for news, but technology will maybe solve this, but we don't sorry. necessarily know how. Sorry, I'm just aware, you know, fitness clubs are uh, good in the service that nobody uses, but everybody pays for. <laughs> uh, you know, wh how, do, how do you get to that place where you're an ash, want to make sure we get the Last questions in, so sorry to, to cut this off, but we want to get the last question. I think the gentleman here had a... Hi, uh, Leandro, Wall Street Journal. Uh, so we've been discussing a lot about uh, different platforms and sort of the interaction between traditional and more news upstarts. Um, I was wondering what, kind of an open question, what the panel thought about um, entities like Now This News, for example, that is completely based off of platforms like Facebook, Vine. Um, another interesting example is Cheddar, which is sort of a CNBC type based entirely on Facebook Live. Is this sort of just uh, accepting the truth or is it sort of chasing, um, you know, now, that, now this news has sort of eye-watering metrics in terms of engagement, for example. Is this uh, a sustainable model, do you think? I think they're really interesting models, and I'm so glad that they exist out in the ecosystem. Uh, you know, they're they're really just going for it. <laughs> they're really taking. Uh, I think, looking at the landscape of how people engage with news and and making a bet that this is how they're going to do it. Uh, I think it's just not pub possible for every publisher to do what they're doing. Um, there are a couple of examples, though, of publishers or news companies that are doing their traditional business but starting new ventures that take this model like CNN has Great Big Story which is largely a Facebook distributed video publisher. Um, you know Al Jazeera had AG Plus, still has AG Plus which is very much a Facebook distributed video publisher so I think there are opportunities, I think it's wise for those who have the resources to try out this model and, and see what happens with it and to some extent you are betting that audience will turn into revenue down the line um, which is a big but. but 
Yeah, I mean, all hail experimentation. Really good that people are trying new things, only of course the important thing is to, to think through what works for you. I mean, what works for each individual brand, what they're trying to accomplish, the kind of journalism they want to do, the value proposition they want to offer their users, and not to fall into this trap that because it works for one startup or one legacy brand, it'll inevitably work for everyone. So I think that's part of a key part of the conversation today, and for me, one of the takeaways from this. So thank you very much, everyone, for your attention, for all your questions and your engagement today, and of course to our panelists and to the task Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, thank you, Rasmus. I'm like one of those uh, very low-cost airlines where I'm sort of, you know, you punch your ticket and then you see them again at the gate, and then you think, hang on, are they flying the plane? Um, we have a coffee break now, uh, and then be back here with us for some brand new research into all of this uh, shortly. Thanks. 3:45.
great. Thanks very much indeed. That's a great credit. Wow, lots of people have stayed. I can't believe how many people are interested in platforms and publishers. It's like it's a really hot issue. Um, thanks very much indeed all for being here. Uh, I'm going to just sort of talk a little bit about the background for this in a minute. Um, just to give you a quick look at um, the background to this. Uh, I'll introduce it, then I'll hand over to our research director. Claire Wardle, or Dr. Wardle, as she insists on being called at all times. Um, people laughing at people who know Claire well. Um, and then at the end, there's going to be a, a chance to ask questions. Um, we have, we're putting up the slides today uh, on a CJR, and we're putting up a piece, a commentary that goes with it as well. There is a link for it, which we will tweet out of the, ha of the Tower Count uh, at some point in the imminent future. Um, so first of all, we're, we're going to talk you through the background to the research, uh, the key findings from publishers, key findings from platforms. Uh, and then we have some brand new content analysis, because one of the important things to say about this, which came up in uh, Rasmus's research, is there really isn't very much data about what is actually going on out there. So it's very easy to sort of get a sense of what's going on out there from what people say, but then when you actually start counting stuff, as they say in academia, um, it presents you with either confirmation of what you thought or a completely different picture. Um, one of the things I just want to talk about for 30 seconds is how the Tau Center ended up here and what our background to this was. So um, we did no research here at all uh, four years ago. Um, and then we uh, were funded by the Knight Foundation. It's great to have Jennifer Preston uh, in the room with us today as our, as our great supporter at Knight. Um, and we figured out this thing called the Town Knight Projects under our former research director, Taylor Owen. It's great that we don't fall out with people. They all keep coming back. Um, and we started under these projects to say we want to look at the intersection between technology and journalism. Um, and we've always focused on, if you like, what that's come to mean is the intersection between journalism and the social web. So we've produced a lot of reports. We started off with, actually, before, uh, before we had any research directors here at all, I wrote a report with Chris Anderson, who sadly has just left, otherwise I could get him to take credit for this as well, and Clay Shirky called Post-Industrial Journalism, where we interviewed a lot of people working in the news industry at the time, and we said this is not prediction, this is a snapshot. And what we observed from it was there's no longer such a thing as the press addressing such a thing as the public. The ecosystem is fragmenting. We said the advertising model is no longer going to support uh, journalism in a digital environment, um, which was something we got actually spectacularly right, even though at the time I think we were hoping we were going to get it spectacularly wrong. Um, after that, uh, we've started to look more and more sort of in a granular way at this. So. Uh, a report actually done by Claire um, when she was uh, a Tau Fellow, before she became Research Director, and Pete Brown, who's currently one of our senior research fellows, was an amateur, and I, ref I referred to this actually in the previous discussion, um, amateur footage, a global study of user-generated content in TV and online news output. That was a really important piece of research because it showed that this is not this is really happening. You know, it's, it's, this is happening in every single broadcast across all the networks we looked at. Um, a tiny paper that we did almost first, uh, I think it was uh, three years ago, Taylor may remember now, it was just, just about three years ago, Nick Diakopoulos, who we now um, work with him and his lab at University of Maryland, he identified this um, <coughs> phenomenon, algorithmic accountability reporting, on, to, on the investigation of black boxes. He was one of the first people who identified that there's a journalistic mission here in trying to figure out what is happening um, in terms of uh, how information reaches people because it's algorithmically sorted. Um, and then Craig Silverman, who is now head of BuzzFeed Canada because we're a very broad church, um, but Craig was originally um, in charge of a project called Regret the Error, uh, and he's made a study, a life's work of figuring out what, how bad stories get propagated online and what we can do to counter them. So we've, we've been building up and interested in this work for a long time. The Town Night Projects really gave us an opportunity to start to look at this uh, more and more often. And as directors do, um, I took all the great work that other people had done, 
and turned it into some pompous speeches of my own, um, one of which was actually at the Reuters Institute uh, two years ago, uh, Silicon Valley and Journalism Make Up or Break Up. Uh, and then in March, um, this was not a religious talk, even though it looks like one, um, <laughs> at Cambridge University, uh, I gave a provocative, non-evidentiary-based uh, non talk uh, called Facebook, uh, eating the, uh, Facebook Eating the World, which was really about, again, the rise of platform power. So as an organization, the Tau Center has been deeply rooted in this area. Um, we had a conference here in November, which was a really a turning point for us, called Journalism in Silicon Valley, which came off the back of the interest of the work and the talks that we'd done up to that point, where we got a lot of people in the room who were platforms, publishers, and also kind of third parties to really start to examine some of the hard questions around that relationship. Because it's undoubtedly the case that journalism, and as uh, um, uh, people sort of used to refer to the fourth estate, you know, that sort of separate publishing entity, um, has been completely upended by the rise of social media. And it's happened much more quickly since we've had smartphones in our hands. Um, I'm sort of delighted to say that all of this uh, effort has led to, oh, sorry, no, uh, before we get to the current research, this actually, we put this together just to show you what has happened in terms of platform activity in the last 18 months, all of which is focused at uh, supporting journalism, creating tools for publishing, arguably taking over some of the functions of publishers, started in January uh, 2015 when Snapchat launched something called their Discover Vertical. Uh, since then, we've had Google, Facebook, Apple, Twitter, all putting money into incentive, incentive programs specifically aimed at journalistic organizations. And so when we were looking at some of the, some of the Reuters uh, data, that's the kind of broad picture. What we wanted to look, look at today was really what is happening as a result of this. Uh, and what we want to do is continue to study you know, this relationship because we think it's creating a third field, if you like. Um, we're really thrilled that, as well as the Knight Foundation, we um, have now attracted funding. We were able to actually do this research because the Abrams Foundation, Amy Abrams is in, 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 in the house today, came along to the uh, conference and said, uh, we'd like to support a little bit of what you're doing. And uh, that enabled us to start to sort of scope the research. We've now got um, extra support as well from the MacArthur Foundation. And the MacArthur money, I'm sorry for talking about founders, but it's foundations, but it's really important to know that the origin of this is independently funded uh, research, which we hope that we can carry on um, for several years to come. So the Mac MacArthur Foundation said, uh, we love the work that you've done so far and your thinking, um, can you extend it? So we have a co-authored project with the MacArthur Foundation and the Knight Foundation, which is really extending this work that we've done for the last two years. We're going to start looking at some of the policy issues and putting policy uh, actors into a room, whether it's researchers, ethicists, platforms and publishers. We're going to have workshops, we're going to do focus groups, and of course, because we're an academic centre, we will produce white papers. Somebody actually said to me, this is very bold of you to be putting raw, so the academic said, very bold of you to be putting up such raw data today, because we actually started this how long ago, Claire? Three months, two months ago. So this is, re this is, this is really recent. And the reason that we're releasing some of the findings today, are, it partly is because we want to extend this work. But also it's partly because the speed at which the field is moving means that I think we get lots more out of research if we release it uh, as soon as we feel that we can. It's not finished, it's not polished. By the time we get a big landscape report out, it will be the end of the year. Um, but we think that this informs the debate now, right now. Um, this is all launching. We'll have a launch event in the fall of 2016, probably on the West Coast when it gets a bit cold and rainy here. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Claire, who is going to talk you through research findings. Um, if you have questions, particularly when we get onto the detailed data slides, uh, do stick your hands up. Ideally, wait till the end, and then we can take all the questions together. Um, I'm going to hand over to Claire. I just wanted to let you know before that, 
do stay around for drinks at the end. Um, and just to say, if you're around on Friday at 9 o'clock downstairs, we have a really fascinating event with BuzzFeed. So the Editor-in-Chief of BuzzFeed, Ben Smith, is coming to talk about the concept of the First Amendment for platforms. Um, should be a fascinating conversation. If you're around, our breakfasts are quite good. So thank you very much indeed, and over to Dr. Wardle. Thank you, Emily. If my 90-year-old grandma is watching, she'll be very proud. She's the only other person that calls me Dr. Wardle. Um, so, and those of you playing a Dr. Wardle drinking game are probably drunk already. Okay, uh, so uh, you've already heard a lot of information. So I'm going to kind of go through these relatively quickly. Um, but just from a methodological point of view, uh, we had one roundtable attended by 15 social media and audience editors a couple of months ago that ended up being a bit like a therapy session with people saying, oh God, I just want to talk to somebody else about this. Uh, we also have done interviews with more than 40 journalists and executives at news organizations. We've interviewed eight platform executives from five companies. We want to obviously increase that. And uh, Pete has carried out a content analysis of nine publishers and their output on 12 platforms with some really detailed um, data and graphs we're going to sh share with you. And lastly, just in the last couple of weeks, we decided that we wanted to look at AMP and actually do some algorithmic analysis of what appears in the AMP carousel. So we're also going to share some of that with you today as well. Uh, so we talked to a number of publishers. Of course, there is a much, much larger number that we could have sampled. We will continue to do that over the two years. These are very uh, clearly the large organizations, but we, they are legacy, they are broadcasters, they are digitally native. We did speak to local brands, uh, but we have to admit they are mostly US-centric at the moment. Uh, these are the platforms we spoke to. Obviously, we would want to speak to more chat apps. Uh, we would like to speak to more executives. It is sometimes more difficult to get access, but I have to say over the last two months, we've been really, really pleased at how many people were willing to talk to us. So I think uh, we will be in a really good situation uh, of hearing from more of them. So key findings, uh, no surprises, there is a relationship occurring between the platforms and the publishers. You know what the next thing's going to say, but it's complicated. <laughs> Uh, and I think we're, we're going to dive into this, but uh, there is nothing simple about this relationship. Um, so key findings. Firstly, some platforms are now publishers by design or default. And depending on your definition of publishers, you could say that all of them are publishers. So that definitional question is really important. Newsrooms are posting ever more journalism directly to platforms, but with little idea of the ultimate reward. So many people said to us, it will not look like this in a year. Uh, this is a very strange time when we're searching for the ROI, but right now, this is what we're doing. So I, we're really pleased to be doing this at a really important historical moment. And somebody in 2090 will look back at a report and be like, ooh, 2016, wasn't that funny? Um, platforms influence much more than distribution, e.g. formats, story selection. This is in the form of obviously publishers looking at metrics and thinking about which types of stories work, what types of formats work. Great conversation earlier about video and how increasingly platforms are saying, we have to put more video in, particularly native video on Facebook. That's what's driving traffic. So there was clearly that influence is there. Uh, publisher strategies for platforms are dictated by business models and no one solution works for all. So we're going to share some graphs with you later that this is not just publishers throwing anything at the wall to see what sticks. There are differences by publishers and the main explanation of those differences is around their business models. Uh, publisher relationships with platforms are certainly not equal. Some people admitted that they're on the phone to the platforms four or five times a day. Other people said, I don't even have an email address. I wouldn't know how to contact the platforms. So there is a real difference here, which is unsurprising, and deals with this question of scale, which is something that many of the platforms talked about as one of their major challenges. And unsurprisingly, as academics, uh, when we did interviews with uh, publishers and platforms, we had a set of questions we wanted to ask, and we left certain ones unprompted to see if anybody brought them up. But questions, for example, around archive and ethics weren't necessarily the first things tripping off people's lips. So there's an interesting question about what remains as an important question that isn't necessarily being front and center in terms of the conversations. So firstly, some publishers are focused on the opportunities. Platforms have given us way more creative freedom than we have in the past to tell a story. We're creating new forms of storytelling, and that came through a great deal. Secondly, our influence in the world has more impact because of the reach we're able to get on these platforms. So people did say, you know, I'm not lying. We are getting much bigger audiences, uh, audiences from different places, audiences of different demographics. Uh, this is a good thing. But this is not going to surprise you. Uh, many publishers feel powerless. 
They are publishers, talking about the platforms. They control the audience in many ways. They're the gateway to the audience and they determine what they will allow and what they won't. It's their world. I see them as a partner, but we call them a frenemy. And I don't even know if that's totally accurate. Secondly, we are collateral damage in the war between platforms. They're fighting with each other. They will promise certain things to some. They'll give a publisher a chance to play, but not to others. So that's, we often talk about publishers versus platforms. There was a lot of discussion as well about the relationship of the platforms with one another. Um, some publishers worry that the industry is hurting itself. This is a quite a powerful quote. I think the New York Times and the Washington Post did a disservice for a lot of us by jumping into bed with Facebook on instant articles so quickly without really scrutinizing the deal. It really ends up hurting us in the long haul. And I think I just want, I forgot to say this earlier. Uh, there's a reason that we don't have names next to these quotes. <laughs> uh, people spoke to us, obviously, uh, and we're an academic institution, so on the, the idea that it was confidential and anonymous. But I think because of that, people were much more honest than they're being on stages at new, uh, journalism conferences. Uh, and this was a quote. I feel I worry that this might become the, the quote of the presentation, but it's incredibly cutthroat right now, and Snapchat plays it very close to their chest in terms of it. So they let you, uh, if they let you onto their platform, it's like the Hunger Games because you fight to get on it and you fight to stay on it. Um, and I think this also goes to the differences by platforms. We should not be thinking about all platforms in one bucket. Uh, Snapchat was talked about in different ways to other platforms. Oh, so key findings from interviews with publishers, six key things. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this is normally when Emily gets up. No, that's a lie. Uh, firstly, business models, as I discussed, are driving platform strategies. Secondly, conflicting opinions exist at the local level too. So this isn't just, oh my goodness, I'm a local publisher, I hate the platforms. It was much more complex. Thirdly, branding on platforms is a key concern for all publishers, and there was a great debate earlier about this question of branding. Fourth, lack of consistent data and metrics is a major challenge for all publishers. Fifth, publishers are worried about who owns the audience. And finally, there was appetite for industry collaboration. So I'm just gonna dig into these very quickly. Business model question. So some of you might have been at an event that was hosted by the New York Daily News last month. And in that, Samantha Barry was there from CNN, and Carla Zanoni, who I think is in the audience, was also there. Um, and I think it's a really interesting look at two different business models and how that's impacting strategy. So this is what uh, Sam was saying. Everything that I'm doing with my social teams around the world, and to be honest, that number's over 40, she also said in that presentation, is all about creating a CNN news habit. And I don't care how or where that habit happens, and I don't care where you're a user. It can be on Snapchat, and you're coming back to us three times a week, or it can be on Facebook Messenger, and you're engaging with our content eight times a week. I care that you have a CNN news habit, and that makes us relevant going forward in the world of disrupted distribution. This is what Carla said. Uh, it is still important to get people back to the site. That was a critical difference. We're looking at distribution platforms as a space where we can build a new relationship with readers and engage with our current readers. There is an understanding that we need to meet the audience where the audience lives. And when that audience is an 18 to 34 year old audience, we understand that there are new habits. And this is really about educating a new audience about what value the Wall Street Journal brings. So Carla was very honest about, you know, we're on Snapchat Discover, we're doing uh, work there, but it, ultimately it's about driving them back to the platform at some point where they will pay. Um, so we talk about platforms in different ways, back to Wall Street Journal. But this is one of, the, I'm just gonna go to the graphs later, but this is a comparison between CNN and Wall Street Journal. So firstly, this is looking at CNN posts between one week, between the 25th of April and the 1st of May. 2,046 posts were made by CNN across eight different platforms, and you can see them along the bottom. Now, if you look at that graph, you can see a big, proportion of that is actually Apple News. Over a thousand posts are onto Apple News. But you can also see in terms of Facebook posts, which are driving traffic back to CNN versus instant articles, there are more instant articles. CNN are happy for people to consume CNN within Facebook's uh, walled garden, essentially. Uh, you see 71 stories on Snapchat Discover, 274 tweets, 240 YouTube posts. Unsurprisingly, they're a broadcaster. So look at the screen, it's like an eye doctor test. Does this look different? So this is uh, Wall Street Journal. You can see not so excited about Apple News <laughs> uh, by quite some margin. Uh, Facebook posts more likely to be posts that link back to the Wall Street Journal compared to instant articles. Um, more tweets, 
obviously fewer YouTube videos, but still 107. So it's only when you start looking at and comparing the platforms, this is not one size fits all. There are different things happening across the different platforms. So we're going to dive a little bit, but I just wanted to compare those two now. I think it's important. Secondly, conflicting opinions exist at the local level too. As I said, some local publishers feel particularly left out. The algorithms, because they favor scale and reach, they're naturally going to favor national and international stories. And so local journalism gets deprioritized. I think we do run the risk of selecting winners in this game. And I think there's an argument here that as algorithms get smarter, they will understand where you are and deliver better local content. But certainly at the moment, there was a sense from publishers is we're being deprioritized. Some local publishers were really honest about still being bogged down in legacy issues. For example, I would love to be in a place where we are thinking about engaging an audience via Snapchat story or Facebook instant articles, but right now we're just not there yet. So compare a CNN with 40 staff working off platform to a local newsroom that's like, are you kidding, Claire? Actually having a social media editor, I'd be lucky, let alone having somebody that could just work on any of these different platforms. So uh, that, was, that came through loud and clear. Resourcing all these different platforms is a huge challenge. Um, however, some local newsrooms see platforms as a route to survival. So this particular person, our very small local sites will close, but they will retain their social presence and they'll be able to publish their instant articles. Actually, we think that that will probably generate more audience for them and probably better commercial than having an actual website. So we completely drank the Facebook Kool-Aid. So this person is saying we wouldn't exist right now if it wasn't for the platforms. Thirdly, branding on platforms is a key concern for all publishers, as we heard earlier. Uh, again, Wall Street Journal, I think it's a, such a lovely example to see the newspaper on the left and Wall Street Journal on Snapchat Discover. Uh, the brands do offer the chance to reinvent themselves for new audiences, and there's some really nice examples happening. Um, but for some platforms, design obscures news brands. And this came out in the, the Reuters report. Uh, and I think we just need to do more digging about when people see brands in their news feeds, what do they think? But somebody's saying, if we're out here for branding but nobody even recognizes it, then that's a problem. Because if our brand is related to the Snapchat brand, then maybe it's not worth it. But this, I, I like this quote too. Individual journalists are also thinking about their brands. So this was somebody saying, instead of competing for the top spots on the homepage, what reporters are saying is, when is my story going to go on the main Facebook page? It's really competitive. It's a bit like the old days of getting the splash because particularly some local journalists have worked out when they all have training in Chartbeat and metrics and they realize that actually their really polished story got five views. Sometimes you don't want to train your journalists in metrics, <laughs> uh, but that means people know, hang on, if I, if I get it on the Facebook main page, it's a totally different story. Fourth, lack of consistent data and metrics is a major challenge for all publishers, and all of you know this, but this came through really, really strongly. Now you have to collect data from another source and be able to compare it to your site data. That's not apples to apples because it's measuring different things and different situations. It's just another strain on your organization. So there's the fact that you can't compare it back to your own data. There's also the problem of what does a video view mean on Facebook versus YouTube? How do you actually talk to your advertising team? How do you talk to your management team when actually as an industry, we haven't worked out what consistent metrics are? And so many people said to us, if we could all have one consistent metric on this, it'd be a different playing field. Um, so we just heard this from absolutely everybody. Uh, lack of data hinders strategy and product development for publishers. Facebook needs to give us access to data so we can better understand what the trade-offs are that we're making and somebody else we just don't have as rich of a story on Facebook as we do on our own site. We can't connect the dots on time spent or reader engagement with an instant article as well as we can with articles on our site. So again, I think many of us in the room know this, uh, but we can't stress it enough because it came up in almost every single interview. Uh, platforms are unpredictable. There's so much mystery to it that we have to stay so vigilant during uh, trying to get on early reads on how the algorithm is treating everything that we're pushing out. We get better at decoding it, but they keep changing it. I think it's important, particularly thinking about Facebook, uh, you know, if, if there are some people from Facebook here, but if they were on the stage, they would say, we are changing the algorithm so that more people see your news articles ultimately in the long run. But when you're a manager who spent a long time getting more eyeballs and then you come in on a Tuesday and it's tanked and you don't know why, it's pretty demoralizing. And Caitlin is actually at the back who did a Tau Center report on metrics and how just even just normal metrics can make journalists feel completely different about their own self-worth when you know how many people are reading you. Uh, fifth, publishers are worried about who owns the audience. So, an example, it all comes back to who owns the relationship with the user. Is it Facebook or us? 
That informs everything in terms of what the advertising team can present, what are the different little conversion hooks that marketing and product can get in there. It all comes down to who controls that relationship and that data. So of course, newsrooms want to say, it's our, it's, you know, for example, New York Times, or their New York Times readers, they just happen to, you know, they just find us on Facebook in the morning, but there are readers. But of course, Facebook, and this is lovely Michael Reckow, lovely smile. Uh, but here he is talking to Emily back in November. And actually, when we went through the transcript, this isn't saying anything against Michael, but his language was our readers, our readers, our readers. And that's because the platforms are very much thinking about their users, their audience. So how does this work? What's the intersection? And this was a, a really strong tension that came out. And we're not going to solve it here. But I think it's important to raise. And finally, some appetite for industry collaboration. Um, Somebody said, and uh, Liz Heron repeated this as well here today, publishers have more leverage than they think. And somebody else saying, we as an industry are not proactively working together to set down equitable terms. There is strength in numbers and understanding what each other is going through. And we certainly heard people saying, you know, it was only when I was at that news conference and I was in the bar and I talked to somebody from a different platform that I worked out what deal they'd got with that platform and I couldn't believe it. You know, so there's this kind of back channeling of we need more transparency so that we can actually negotiate with these platforms. Um, so I think more and more people are starting to say, when are we gonna get together to start talking about what this means? So just to sum up a, a few other things we didn't uh, mention. Uh, yes, creative opportunity vastly expanded. For most publishers, a better experience for users, particularly mobile. Platform teams and initiative, initiatives viewed positively. So this is the really interesting point is that the partnership teams at almost every platform are former journalists. So they're really interesting kind of hybrid teams who understand both sides. And many people said how good their relationships were with those people. And that other people were saying, well, actually, we have to think when we talk about the platforms, are we talking about my partnership manager? Or are we talking about the platforms as a whole? And unsurprisingly, the down emoji. Uh, lack of transparency around the algorithms, surrendering control for no net financial benefits, and serving multiple platforms is very resource intensive. So key findings from interviews with platforms. This is just an overarching one, which I really liked. As someone pointed out, there was Craigslist before, then it was Google, now it's Facebook, it will be Snapchat next. The world is evolving and people are getting their news in different ways and as a compliment to the way they've always got their news. We didn't set out to do this. I wish we could all say we had a strategic vision. Instead it was, huh, people like news. Let's give them more news. So this sense from many of the platforms, which is, we're not the kind of the evil beings who are waking up every morning trying to bring down the industry. <laughs> this has happened and we're evolving and we're trying to get this right. So um, six points. One, and this was again something that Vivian said <laughs> really eloquently, the two mentalities and cultures are very different when you think about platforms and publishers. And people in these hybrid partnership teams who'd worked in both were very clear to say, I've worked in newsrooms, it is very different here. Secondly, frustration at the way platforms are discussed in the media. So again, tr this question of transparency came up earlier about why aren't the platforms more transparent about what they're doing. From a platform's perspective, they were very clear of every time we do put our head above the parapet, <laughs> we get shot at. So there is this sense of how should the media be discussing this? How can there be that understanding of how algorithms work? How can this conversation be had? Um, and this, this frustration came through from uh, almost all of our uh, interviewees all struggling with how to scale their partnerships. Platforms want to collaborate with the news industry to find solutions, so this came through as well as, as, well as the industry, the news industry talking about collaboration. The platforms were saying, we're not gonna come up with these solutions ourselves. How can we find spaces to have useful conversations as opposed to going to a journalism conference where there's 100 journalists, one of us, and everybody shouts at us and asks us what the best policy is for this particular tool. So how can those spaces exist for collaboration? Uh, no two platforms are the same. <laughs> Every single interview with a platform made it clear, well, we're not like them. <laughs> that came through very strongly. And finally, frustration that publishers haven't done more to innovate. So quite a few people said, I wish we'd seen more of this happening within newsrooms as opposed to blaming us. How could we have created more innovation in newsrooms themselves? Which is quite hard to hear, but that also came through. So the two mentalities of cultures are very different. The news industry hasn't caught up with the fact that, that we're no longer in an era of editor choice. It's user first. It's all about news personalization. And this isn't a quote, but this is something I want to say. Interviews at uh, platform companies talked about having a culture of innovation, that there was far less fear of failure compared to newsrooms. But at the same time, when the media covered, and I'll get to this in a second, new, uh, 
platforms, every time there was a little change, there was this idea, this is the ultimate solution, as opposed to, we might pull that product again in three months, but this isn't it, we're just in the middle of innovating. Secondly, frustration the way platforms are discussed in the media. Uh, the media are looking for the moonshot. They want every platform change to be the solution, which as I just mentioned, and somebody else said, how can we get the benefit of the doubt? So there was this idea of the news industry is very quick to blame us, uh, and sometimes we are screwing up and we are doing things that are problematic, but every time we see articles about our particular company, uh, there's always, it's because we've done something wrong. Um, thirdly, all struggling with how to scale their partnerships. So it's my big bugbear, right? If you want to ring us, who do you ring? So the emphasis is how do you deliver an always on product support to a range of publishers well beyond the people you can actually actively handhold. And this came through very strongly. There are certain people who get the white glove treatment, and of course they're the much, much bigger organizations. Uh, many people who just, that's impossible to scale. So how, what does that look like beyond a website, which is, here's some reasons you can use our platform. You know, there's a real struggle here with what the solution might look like. Uh, we want to give tools to people so that they can do things for themselves as opposed to us doing it for them. Fourth, platforms want to collaborate. It's more about finding a path together. We need to use the opportunities when we're in the same room to show that there is more of a possibility for us to be productive together. But again, how does that look like? Are they in closed sessions? What are the logistics of that? No two platforms are the same. I really thought this was interesting. No two platforms are the same, yet we are placed in the same social media bucket. Researchers differentiate between network news and cable news, newspapers versus online news, yet we are all just labeled social media. So there was an idea of like, when are we going to start thinking more strategically about these platforms as being different? And Snapchat, very, you know, ultimately could be discussed as a broadcast network, elements of Discover, uh, very different to Twitter, again, very different to Facebook when we think about reliance on algorithm, we think about, um, you know, reliance on uh, the users and how uh, that, that interactions that users have versus a very passive model. So during interviews, platforms would compare themselves to one another, explaining the number of years since their launch, their different philosophies around the networked versus native models, and their different levels of reliance on algorithms, and that came through very strongly. So get your phones ready, people. This is when you're gonna take photos of slides and tweet them. <laughs> who is posting what where? So this was Pete Brown, who a few months back saw that image that BuzzFeed put out that you might have seen that was kind of 80% of their journalism was happening off buzzfeed.com. And he said, what does this look like for everybody else? So he decided to make, arguably, one of the most green slides you'll see in this presentation. Uh, and I apologize for people in the room who might not be able to see exactly, but the, we looked at eight publishers on the left-hand side, and we looked at what platforms they were on, looking at 12 different platforms. And the biggies are there. The List app is even there, those of you who might enjoy the List app. Um, but if you look at who's on the most platforms, it's actually BuzzFeed, 19 out of 21, and CNN, sorry, I said 12. BuzzFeed, 9 out of 21, and CNN, 19 out of 21. So um, the lowest actually is Vox, with 14 out of 21. So it's not until you start counting things that you realize it's, not, it's just not all BuzzFeed doing this. It's many different uh, publishers, the big ones, obviously. And here's an example from Vox of a story they put out around February 29th and leap year. And I was a social media manager a couple of years back for the UN, and at that time, you simply took a link and you put it on every single platform. Uh-uh, that doesn't happen now. So this is an example from Vox that you can see they took that story and they turned it into content for Snapchat Discover, the List app, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. That's a busy social media team for simply one story. And this is the same for the Wall Street jo uh, Journal, a story about Harriet Tubman, the same, Snapchat Discover, the Wall Street Journal app, the List app, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Apple News versions. So it, when you start thinking about resourcing, it's only when you look at this that you realize the scale that people are having to work around. So over one week, the news organizations we sampled published on average 1,178 posts across seven platforms. Remember, that was eight news organizations that we sampled. The lowest was Vox, 603 posts on seven platforms. The highest was CNN with over 2,000 posts on eight platforms. That's a lot of stuff <laughs> on things that are not related to your particular brand. So overall, these are, uh, if you look at all the different platforms, um, it's the same that week. On average, 10,000, not on average, the total N, 10,622 posts from eight publishers over a week on all those different platforms. Unsurprisingly, Apple News is the highest because it has the lower, lowest barrier to entry in terms of it's essentially an automated feed. Uh, 2, 000, over 2,000 posts on Twitter, over 
two, my eyes, 2,349 on Facebook, 751 on YouTube, it's still there, uh, 415 Snapchat stories, 392 Snapchat Discover stories, 177 Instagram posts. So Instagram is interesting. That was lower than we expected. Um, interestingly, actually talking to lots of newsrooms, Instagram often started being owned by the picture desk. So there's an interesting point about the strategy of this and where different platforms started and how they're being centralized and managed in a much more strategic way. Um, this is a colorful slide. <laughs> this is why we're going to be circulating them. Um, but it's a beauty. These are the key platforms. So the pink you can see is Apple News. Uh, the blue, dark blue, is Facebook. The light blue is Twitter. The yellow is Snapchat. The red is YouTube. We tried to think about the colors that were similar to the icons. Um, but it, as we said, it's the same is not the case across all different publishers. People have very different strategies about what they're posting and where. Um, and Apple News, as you can see, is a big player for many people, uh, but not for everyone. Uh, this is the donut slide. So this is comparing who's posting to Facebook as a link to Facebook that drives traffic back to the website versus who's posting to instant articles, which means that the story remains in the Facebook ecosystem. So the orange is post driving traffic back to the publisher's website. So if you look at Vice, they're not crazy about instant articles. Uh, but if you look at Vox, much more likely to post to instant articles. Uh, if you look at the New York Times, they're kind of, their donut is half and half. Um, so there again is significant differences here. Fox News uh, loves an instant article, Fox News, huge traffic on Facebook. Uh, so again, uh, fans of content analysis, and we include ourselves in this, it's not until you start looking at this data that you realize there's different things happening. So uh, we use these terms native versus networked. If you think, as Emily said, it was only January 2015 that Snapchat Discover launched, and then in April the instant articles launched. When we say native, you can only see the articles posted to those native spaces by being logged on to Snapchat or Facebook. So 18 months ago, that choice didn't exist. It was all about links sending people back to the website. So in 18 months' time, we've got to a situation now where the majority of links out of 10,000 are going to spaces that sit within Snapchat or within Facebook. Um, and even Instagram, which doesn't have an easy way to send traffic back, uh, versus the networked model, which is sending people back to your website. So as Emily said, this has happened very quickly and has been quite substantial. And we found those numbers quite surprising. I think I personally thought those numbers would be reversed in terms of proportions. So going back to four examples, this was the CNN slide. Remember that one? This is the Wall Street Journal slide. This is Vox, so smaller numbers. Uh, again, interesting to see more reliance on instant articles, less on Apple News. And finally, Washington Post, which again is you know, thinking about scale, but is also in introducing more of a kind of a subscription model. Uh, but at the moment, and Jeff Bezos was very clear to say, we're all in on instant articles. So you can see there 246 instant articles versus 12 traditional Facebook posts. Um, so some real differences there when you look at the different platforms. And this is just looking at Facebook, so types of content posted to Facebook. Um, live is gray. So if you look at who's doing the most live, and this, remember, this is very early on in live's evolution, uh, but Huffington Post, uh, BuzzFeed, and you can see the, you know, in, the, in the Times, but there is an element there of who's being paid. Um, and so there's, well, we will carry on doing this, but it's gonna be interesting to see whether this graph changes over time. So lastly, uh, I talked about Google Trends and wanting to interrogate AMP. So uh, many of you know, obviously, how Google Trends works. And our ace computational journalists here basically were pulling data from Google Trends to look at what trending keywords were appearing and then taking those keywords and actually putting them into AMP to then say, OK, if I'm somebody who sees a trend or is interested in a particular term, I might go to Google and search for that keyword. When you look at the AMP carousel, which comes up on your mobile, what stories are people seeing in that carousel? So this is what our team have been working on. And it's very early days, but they've built a front end which allows us to kind of have a start date, an end date, and to put keywords in. So what we did as a pilot study was to look at the keywords of Orlando and Florida in the last week, which were the two keywords that obviously were associated with this particular story. We did take out the word alligator 
because obviously that would have that was a different story coming out of Orlando. It was a difficult week last week. Um, but this pilot study, uh, you can see here, data gathered at 45 minutes past every hour. That's when the scraping was occurring. 28 carousels containing relevant stories related to Florida or Orlando. Two, 244 relevant stories in these carousels. 38 different publishers had stories in the carousel. So I'm about to show you what those publishers were, but this is the background. So here's kind of the, is it the top 20? Because the numbers are ish. Uh, so if we take, for example, NBC News, which appeared in the carousels the most 19 times, with an average position in the carousel of 4.4 versus, um, I'm trying to think of a, who's got a higher average, say Yahoo, only appeared in the carousels nine times, average position 3.2. But when you look at this long list, uh, there are the main players are in there, but Russia Today ranks number fifth, number five. Breitbart did appear in here. There are a number of different publishers in this space, but for us, this is another important question to look at. Who's appearing? When are they appearing? Uh, the AMP algorithm, we think, is different to the Google News algorithm, um, but this is just another piece of research to, to, to look at algorithms properly. Okay, so to conclude, I am very aware that it's gone from freezing in here to boiling. <laughs> uh, so I apologize. I just saw so many fanning themselves. And I was like, we're not very good at temperature control in the, in the journalism building. Okay, so uh, you might not be able to see this. On the left-hand side, we did, uh, when we had our round table, we asked people to draw their newsroom. So back in 2008, when I started studying uh, user-generated content at the BBC, at that time, I remember that the interactive unit was on the seventh floor. <laughs> the newsroom was on the first floor. People were like, well, if you want to do anything with the web people, you have to get in the lift and go to the seventh floor. And what's interesting now is to watch the shift of social news teams becoming much more at the center of what's happening. Um, so the rise of the role of platforms in journalism means social teams are increasingly making key strategic and editorial decisions. They have access to the data, they know what the audience likes and doesn't like, and are much more likely to be sitting next to the news director or somebody much more um, editorially significant in the newsroom. And Emily came, uh, came with this idea a couple of days ago, and I think it's absolutely spot on, which is, as with legacy to web 1.0 20 years ago, there is no uniformity about how publishers approach this. And in fact, lots of the language of anxiety, should we be there or not? What should we be putting there or what shouldn't we be putting there? Uh, I think if we were to do an, a kind of a discourse analysis that compared language with this 20 year period, we'd see I identical anxieties about, should we be pay charging for this or not? Should we actually have separate teams? Um, so I, I think that's really interesting. Um, but we also have to stress that in some newsrooms, it is still under-resourced or seen as suspicious and peripheral. So many of the main publishers we, we have shown you graphs around are the big guys with lots of resources. These are the people where this applies to. But there are many, 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 many publishers who are like, <laughs> nah. You know, people who just said, we are not there. We are a million miles away from that. And actually, people are still not quite sure why we'd want to post outside our website. So just very quickly, some non-commercial but important civic issues that remain unaddressed. Uh, archive. Uh, many people, when we talk to them about archive, it didn't often come up unprompted, but would say, yes, this is what I'm losing sleep about at night. We're creating all this content, and it's not systematically going into an archive. We're publishing it on platforms like Snapchat where it disappears. This is a real problem, and we as an industry have not thought about it. Um, so that's something that we're really going to focus on just because if there's any solutions, I think, as an industry, we need to think about them. Uh, ethics and standards. Uh, we haven't talked enough about native advertising, but uh, and Vivian was interesting. She said, I don't think this is a problem in terms of how it's labeled. I'm still not convinced that, again, as an industry, we've really thought through the transparency of native advertising and how we label that, particularly on platforms. Um, but certainly, transparency of distribution process and algorithms, uh, there's more work that's needed, and there's more education of audiences that's needed. And I'd also say this, well, we would all say this, transparency is needed from publishers too. I'm not convinced all of these Facebook Live videos are as live as we'd like to think they are and haven't been rehearsed. And I think many of you potentially saw the New York Times editorial meeting, but I don't think the New York Times is alone in doing live video is tricky. If you're a big brand, you want to make sure that you've had a practice and you know what's going to happen. So uh, there's interesting questions here, but... I think there's a problem with journalists as gatekeepers when they're trying to cover stories involving the relationship with platforms and publishers, and they're part of that story. Uh, 
Uh, and there are some good examples of great journalism in the last few uh, weeks about this, um, but I think we have to be better about it. Um, and ultimately, by incentivizing publishers to use certain tools and create journalism in certain formats, platforms are changing dynamics inside newsrooms, and I don't think there's enough transparency about how that shift is actually happening. So, uh, next steps. Uh, Landscape Review will be published later in the year, which will pull together all of this and more. Uh, we're going to be holding four policy exchange forums around key issues over the next 12 months. Uh, there'll be issues around uh, archive, ethics, data, uh, and other issues like that. Content analysis expanded to include local publishers and to track changes. This was just the first phase. We need to, what does this look like if we take local publishers in the US and elsewhere? Uh, algorithmic analysis will be continued and focus groups will be carried out over the next six to nine months. And actually, when Liz Heron talked earlier about it's not just publishers and platforms, it's also audiences, Pete Brown sent me a little text and said, oh yeah, it should be P and P and A. Uh, and that's partly because we will be doing research with audiences to get a sense of what they're thinking, what they're confused about, what they more, want more transparency around. So I think um, Emily is going to join me on stage and we have the research team here, but does anybody have any questions about the research or things that you think we've missed? things that you wish we'd done. I think you might need to stand up at the yeah, microphone, sorry, please. The, uh, mic just Thank you. Hi, um, Karis Palmer, I'm from The Conversation in Australia and we're also here in Boston. Uh, I'm just interested in if you saw, as platforms or as companies, media companies, publishers, invest more in all of these new platforms, they all cost resources, as you said, is there any evidence that they're pulling back in other areas? So like their homepage or other platforms that they might have historically invested in and they've had to say, okay, well, we've got to choose here. It's about finite resources. Are we going to move from one into the other? How are they making those decisions? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. There, there is evidence of people saying we can't do it all. Uh, and again, it depends on the size of the publisher. Um, but there, there is evidence of we're having to make strategic decisions. Um, I don't think people are necessarily being as honest with us about what well, we're pulling exactly from this video team. It'll be interesting off the back of the Reuters report and whether people are like, oh, maybe we're throwing too much into our video units. But um, did you want to say? No, I was just going to say, we haven't looked at that, but it's a very obvious area to look at. Um, you know, anecdotally, it's completely anecdotally, uh, homepage resources have traditionally been very, very, very intensive. Mm. We said very clearly we think the platforms are publishers and they're taking over more and more of those um, functions. But there is a bit of a lack, you know, and, and as Claire said, some of the, a lot of people were saying, you know, in a year we, we're going to evaluate what we're doing and then either pull back from this, pursue a different strategy, etc. It's really hard to see this reversing to that extent for everyone. So therefore the obvious question is, how is that affecting actual structures in newsrooms and, and where people where people where are they getting all the where they yeah exactly and, <laughs> yeah. and and where editors are looking you know what what are editors looking at <laughs> journalists are looking at where the audience is mm. without too shadow, too, without any shadow of a doubt mm. thank you you have to stand up Caitlin Sorry, and get to <laughs> Um, hi, I'm Caitlin I'm from Yale University. So I had a question about linking the interviews that you guys have been doing with the content analysis. So in cases where you were both looking at content distributions across these platforms and talking to folks who are working at these publishers, was, were you able to kind of draw a direct line between, okay, you know, we know some of the specifics of Vox's level of communication with Facebook versus Snapchat or the kind of deal that they got, and was there a direct line between what you knew about that from the interviews and what you were seeing in terms of their strategy on these platforms, or did it seem a little bit more helter-skelter random? Yeah, I mean, um, when Pete did those graphs, we said, well, we have to go back to all of these publishers and ask, was this because this particular week, Huffington Post was doing an experiment with that particular type? Right. So uh, we did try and go back to some. Not everybody returned our phone calls, if you're that person. Can you 
in fact. <laughs> um, but I think ultimately there are lines to be had. You know, the, the strategy question about we do this because of that, uh, there, there are lines about that. So we, 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 we didn't get enough specifics to put that up there, but we're definitely starting to see how we can explain the content analysis through interviews. One, and one, one thing that you probably read today, there's a story out, I think, that the journal actually reported, though I've rather unfortunately tweeted the link to someone who's aggregated it, which is there at the, the <laughs> journal. The journal have got hold of documents from inside Facebook which show how much they're paying publishers to promote live video. So it goes up to sort of New York Times and BuzzFeed, according to the report, is $3 million kind of indeed. Which is, you know, it's, just, it's, it's, quite a lot of, it's quite a lot of money. It's a whole kind of Texas Tribune's um, uh, budget for a year. Uh, so in those lines, one of, the things we have, one of the things that we did say, and I think it was in the slides, and if it wasn't, you know, kind of it's worth saying, is that actually publishers need to be, we think publishers need to be much more transparent about the nature of those relationships. This is not all on the platforms. You know, some of this is, you know, when we talk about the industry sort of damaging itself, there is definitely not a completely level playing field, but we don't always know what it is. Question, if you do live video and you're being paid for it as a publisher, should you be marking it in exactly the same way that you would native advertising? Because at the moment, they may be admitting to being paid, but they're certainly not marking this was, you know, we received money yeah. to do this broadcast. So, so there, are, there are definitely lines, but I think more, more can be drawn. As, as we say, it's only a week of content analysis, you would need to look at a lot more content analysis and then marry it to some of the, some of the things that we know about. So, you know, when, when Facebook Live appears, it does happen to have appeared with publishers that are paid for it. Yeah. Could be other reasons too. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pearl. Um, I remember reading a story in the Financial Times recently about the decline in reach across Facebook for all publishers. I don't remember the exact number, but it was quite a significant drop since January to May. And I was wondering whether that coincided with a rise in paid social, um, and if you looked into paid social at all and how many publishers are using that as a strategy to reach a wider audience. Yeah, no, that's an excellent question. And we didn't explicitly ask, but it was interesting talking to a couple of people who came back to us saying, have you asked those questions? They were from smaller publishers. Because if you actually look at how much the larger publishers' marketing teams are spending to boost posts, that is a lot of money that's being spent in a different way, but it's not necessarily part of editorial. So it's not something that we studied for this, but I think it's again goes back to the transparency question, uh, which is if we look at the big publishers who are very, very successful on social, how much of that is organic and how much is because they're boosting posts? Oh, and we don't know the answer. Any other questions? Definitely silence. <laughs> I mean, I think that, you know, just go back to the, as I say, the key slide really is where you see how much, sorry, Shep, the key slide is where you see the, 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 how much what we call native is being posted. So, as, as, you know, as Claire said, um, and Apple News is an interesting one. Apple News has cropped up here as well. Uh, Apple News, if you look at the commentary around who's important in terms of the news ecosystem, or, or barely doesn't register, you know, so everything's about Twitter, it's about Facebook, um, but partly because of the ease of posting to Apple News, uh, you know, it's kind of pretty, once you're in it, you're kind of automate, you know, it's, it's easy to, it's automated. Um, but it's also very interesting just to see the volume of stories going through it, and if you think that, well, Apple is actually a platform that does control payment mechanisms, you know, that is trying to sort of build a very different ecosystem to, say, Google and uh, the ecosystem that it's building. Um, that's a kind of that, I think that that's going to emerge as a really sort of interesting point about, you know, will scale work for these publishers as well? So when we talk about, you know, kind of engagement levels dropping on Facebook uh, for, you know, news. One of the questions that we didn't talk about in the background to this, but which hangs over all of it, which is, why is news so important to platforms? Um, and, you know, the answer is, uh, you know, because it does drive, because it does drive repeat visits, it does drive engagement, it gives people things to uh, talk about. Um, and, you know, that is something which 
was new to the platforms. As Claire said, it was absolutely right there on the slide, which is, oh, you know, who knew that news would be so popular? That's another kind of, you know, point where the two cultures are sort of converging and coming up with, if you like, a slightly different dialogue. Rasmus. Uh, thanks very much uh, for sharing this, and I can't, as an academic, I can't praise you enough for sharing this while it's hot and very live uh, compared to the way in which we in our tribe too often hide these things away in, in ways that serve our interests, but not necessarily the people we're studying and, and trying to help understand the world. Um, so I think that's really laudable. Um, I guess uh, my question is, um, it seemed to me that, that, that part of your interpretation is that a lot of this is mediated by the business model, uh, and I think that's very likely in many cases, but it seems to me that that's almost like a best case scenario because that's premised on the idea that most publishers know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess um, I fear that it is the case that many publishers are still trying to figure out what, what is it actually that they want to do online and what is the the balance between their editorial priorities and the business that they need to sustain those, what does that actually look like online, let alone in the distributed environment? Um, and, and if you have that um, uncertainty about what you're trying to do, then it becomes very hard to be strategic and rational and evidence-based. Um, so I guess I just want to sort of ask whether, uh, in addition to all the very smart and thoughtful people that you quoted here, were there also moments of doubt and uncertainty in these conversations where uh, people who are smart and thoughtful um, opened up and also shared with you their um, uncertainty about where all this is heading and how it all fits together, if at all. Because uh, I guess that's something I get a lot from when I speak to publishers in Europe. And I think that may not only be in Europe, but also many parts of this great republic. Um, it may, again, it was, I think it was on the slide about business models where we said, you know, there was just this feeling that uh, publishers felt disempowered. In other words, we have to go here, it's a forced march, we have no idea. If it, I mean, the one thing to be clear about, apart from, you know, obviously if you get paid for doing uh, Facebook Live, is that we didn't see anybody saying, it's very clear that this is going to benefit our business in the long run. Not one person. So given the volume and the speed at which this shift has happened, and given the fact that there is clearly no, there is no clear benefit to any one category of publisher, it's, it's you know, exactly those doubts were, it was, you know, almost like a, we have to try this and see. There's a range of, you know, we saw the local publisher saying, if we couldn't put our stuff out on Facebook Live, we just wouldn't exist. We don't, we no longer have a model in this. So, you know, it's got to kind of work better than the alternative. So there's, you know, so there's that range of opinion, right up to, actually, I, th I mean, I think what we did see was a, some publishers have a really sophisticated uh, strategy for this. Um, and some of them have talked about it openly. So, you know, BuzzFeed has a very sophisticated strategy for this. But also, you know, kind of places like the journal, very, very clear about which platforms they need to be on where. You know, they're not, if, they, if they're going for scale, it's always to get people back into the funnel of subscription. So I think that, you know, kind of, and I'm, I, you do hear, lots of doubts, the web one slide, you know, it is exactly the same conversations that were played out about, should we be online? <laughs> um, how much should we be online? Should we put everything online? Should we put a few things online? If you, if you, if you substituted the web for social platforms, you could probably, as Claire said, do a, actually discourse analysis, which showed that, you know, we're in exactly the same place. I think the, sort of the, the, the upside is that we, we're learning quicker and we have better data. So I don't imagine that that conversation is going to take the, te the 10 years that it took us uh, last time around. But maybe I'm too optimistic. I think very quickly also what was fascinating was uh, some of these social media teams are led by really some of the smartest people in terms of this because as we know this stuff changes all the time so actually what's interesting is seeing the relationship between these social media teams and audience growth teams and digital strategy teams and the management. Because actually a lot, of, they would say a lot, I can't explain to my managers why we should be doing X, Y, and Z, but they trust me. But I've probably got six months to prove it. And, I th and whereas other people are like, nope, they absolutely are behind us. They're the ones that are pushing it. So there's real differences there again around the people who are doing this. They're doing it because they, they have in their own minds a strategy. Whether that's coming from the top, again, differs in many ways. Um, 
Is that a question? Yeah. Oh, can I ask a question? Sorry, because I was about to say we are sort of up to time, but I think we okay. can, we Thanks can so much. First of all, this is great. Um, one question, I'm sorry, sorry if you covered you just this. Identify oh, yourself. yeah, I'm Cynthia Collins from the New York Times. I was going to say, if anyone doesn't know Cynthia, or indeed can't <laughs> okay. remember when Thank she um, identifies um, so herself earlier. Just one question about the volume of posts when you were comparing it. Was it just from the main institutional accounts? Yes. That's it, okay. Yes. So a point about BuzzFeed, yeah. it's BuzzFeed News, yes. because BuzzFeed has 1990-something 90, 90 pages, 99 pages, is it, on Facebook alone so and that would be food verticals lifestyle etc so just to try and you know journalism school and we're trying to compare like with like main institutional accounts except probably buzzfeed but we took buzzfeed news as being a separate vertical to okay whatever um, yeah, BuzzFeed was kind of unique because they they were on Apple News as BuzzFeed with a news channel. So, like, mm -hmm. if we say they haven't, they're not using Apple News. We're kind of being disingenuous, so mm -hmm. we had to muddy the lines with that in a way that we didn't have to with the others. Okay, thank you. And then one other point, I just want to ask about the Facebook Live you you referenced in New York Times video. Um, if you could just go back, I just want to potentially correct the record. I think, Please do. yeah, if you were. Um, so the transparency is needed from publishers. There was a bit of a false narrative, I think, that got out there about this story. So just for those of you who follow this one, um, Gawker wrote a post that insinuated that these folks were pitching story ideas. And they were really talking about stories that Carolyn should be pitching at the news meeting for A1 placement. So it wasn't like something that the way Gawker presented it was just a little bit inaccurate, I would say. So just Can wanted I, to correct that record. If that's what you were questioning that's about a this great, piece. No, that's a great, that's very good clarification. Okay. Is this, sorry, could I also ask yeah. you, but is this part of the, the paid for deal with Facebook Live? This is, I this, don't know is why a I'm Facebook, this. this is a Facebook Live <laughs> right. video, yes. Right, okay, and that's all sort of it. So, so in other words, it could yes, be that- Yes, I, I cannot speak to any speak sort of the business strategy. Yes, exactly. yes. Okay. Yeah. We'll come back to you in a, during our transparency session <laughs> in six months time. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, just also, this Facebook Live question is, ongoing particularly because of that story that came out earlier is that a that Facebook is saying that it's these publishers are part of a beta test so that, that Facebook has got enough live video to test potential monetization and also stability and connectivity so that is out there but the other thing to say is when we spoke to a lot of publishers about Facebook live they said yes we are getting money but actually it's not huge amounts of money and more we can't afford to not be in this space because, so I think, again, this is much more complex than simply they're only doing it because they're getting paid. But again, when we kind of have a proper conversation about it when there's an absence of transparency about what's happening. Okay, um, Claire, I want to thank you. That was an, a heroic effort to zip through what was 70-something slides in 45 minutes. You hit the... Uh, <laughs> um, and as, as Rasmus notes, this is not finished, but we like, we, as we had people looking at research and a lot of the, um, I, I know a lot of you are either on social media desks or work with platforms or whatever. Um, so I would offer an open, open invitation, first of all, for really frank feedback um, on what else we should be looking at, given what we've got. Um, uh, we will be pursuing this plus expanding those categories of search. Um, I want to thank you all for coming today. I want to say if you're around um, on Friday morning, come back for the conversation on the First Amendment and social platforms. Again, it's an area where those two sides are converging. Um, and please join us downstairs in the Brown Institute for a drink right now. Thank you very much indeed.